There we go. Welcome everyone to the second second show of the day. Uh, today's guest is uh, very very special to me, and it, from last month I hadn't spoke to him in sixteen years. Wow. We're old. <laughs> time, yeah, time flies, man. It was so good to catch up with you last month. Uh, you know, we had a night out and we talked a little bit, but, you know, now we can actually have a real conversation, you know, not surrounded with Sylvan. <laughs> <laughs> the one, the only, Chavo Guerrero Jr. Bonjour, monsieur. Comment ça va? Ah, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, usually we talk about, you know, how you started out in the business and all that stuff. And uh, I know you're much like myself. You grew up in the wrestling business. Guerrero, the Guerrero families, oh, my God, from Gory Guerrero to to your Uncle Eddie and your father, Chavo Sr. I, I miss that guy so much. Fuck, he was so great. Um, so, yeah, so, like, did you were born and raised on the West Coast? You're always from California? Or did um, you... Born in Texas, man. We were born in El Paso, Texas. That's the home of the Guerreros. Right. And uh, we still say it's the home of the Guerreros because that's kind of, that's really where we settled and started most of us, our wrestling type career. But uh, when I was younger, my father started wrestling for a promotion in Los Angeles at the Olympic Auditorium called uh, NWA Hollywood. Like before this one, like it was the WWA, I believe it's called. <clears throat> And uh, um, he was supposed to come in for, you know, six months. So he went for a month or two and flew back. I was like, hey, guys, I think we're I think we've got to move because he was wrestling the likes of Roddy Piper. And it was a very my dad was very was bilingual and it was, that was not very common back then. Right. <clears throat> so they were looking there. They had lost their uh, this is just a quick brief history, but they had lost their TV on the American um american channel i guess so they are like on a channel 52 which was a hispanic channel uh, so so they needed a bilingual person but fluent bilingual you know and you know guys like mil mascaras would come and stuff but he didn't speak any english and that's right. just you know they needed both because you, you know you needed to draw both people like yourself yeah so uh they tried him out my dad you know was just a super ring technician was really really good and then him and Roddy Piper, a young Roddy Piper, hooked up and they tore the his, the the territory on fire. So we ended up moving here. And so we stayed and we never left. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's so cool, man. Wow, yeah. Now, I would go back and forth to El Paso a lot because that's where Eddie was still at. Yeah. So we were, you know, I'd spend summers with him or he'd spend summers with me and Christmases and, and you know, Easter's and stuff. And we were always, always, always together. But um, so... El Paso really was a second home for me, a hundred percent. You know, it's so weird, man, because like, because Eddie was your uncle, but when I saw you guys together, I was like, they're brothers. We were brothers. We're three right? years apart. You know, typically, I mean, technically, he's my uncle because he's my dad's youngest brother. Yeah. But my dad was eighteen was he when he was born, and then my dad was twenty one when I was born. Okay. So very, very, very close in age. You know, three years apart. We grew up as brothers. Yeah. And we would both joke about it because he was, we we're both not planned. We we're both not supposed to be here. He was my <laughs> grandpa's late mistake. And my dad, I was my dad's early mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so Los Guerreros and WWE Los Guerreros were, were not supposed to be. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, okay. So when did you finally decide that you wanted to do it? Did you feel forced into it or were you like me? You just fucking loved it. My entire my entire life, man, yeah. loved it, man. We had a wrestling ring in the backyard. Yeah, me too. My family's house, you know, there was no swing set. There was a wrestling ring, and that yep. was our swing set. Yep. You know, we literally, and it was the when the old ring from the forties. It was hard, and oh man, I'd be outside and just uh So you know, we didn't know any difference. I just that thought how the rings were. You know, no yeah. give, no spring, just hard. Yeah. Um, uh, and. You know, I mean, that was our tent. We we learned we both learned to walk in a, in a wrestling ring. We would camp out underneath it. We would, <laughs> yeah, we would take off the top rope because it was too hot, tall for us. So the second rope was our, was our top rope. We right. would jump off of that. So I can't believe we didn't kill ourselves in that thing. Right. But really, I mean, like that was yeah, that was we were always wrestling our 
everything was wrestling coming from a wrestling family our promotion you know my grandfather has promotion there so everything was wrestling you know he, he was the first one to have the dual promotion that was in el paso texas but also in like juarez mexico and places right around that so we wrestle both places <clears throat> so you know um anybody anybody from like the like the world class you know the von eric territory yeah. that would come wrestle for my grandfather well they loved it because they would wrestle in in juarez mexico as well right and, and they would be able to go, you know, over the border and have fun and do all the stuff. So, you know, they all loved it. It'd be like, you know, going from winds, you know, from um, um, what is it? Um, was it uh, Buffalo to Windsor? What's what's next to Windsor? Detroit. Detroit to Windsor, right? So we go Detroit, and Detroit's great, but then you go Windsor, and that's really great. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Yeah, you it's know? kind of like uh, Stu Hart because Stu would run in Alberta, but he also went down in the states into Montana. Exactly. And, right, but Montana, so. Montana was nothing. Montana was nothing there. So he would do that occasionally, but there's not a lot of a big population. My right. grandfather, we had a huge population in El Paso and a huge population in, in Juarez, Mexico. So right. they had, he had both of the best of both worlds. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, the first time I saw you wrestle was on WCW, but I mean, you had a whole career before you, because shit, man, how old were you when you got to WCW? So I started WCW, at tw uh, I was 25. So I really didn't have a whole career. So I, 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 I started, so I was, I was ready to start. So Eddie started training when he was, I think he's, I think he went pro at 18. Mm. Uh, but I wanted to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. When I turned 18, you know, I was still hadn't hit a growth spurt yet. I was still small and, you know, I was very young for my, my, my grade and my age. I was kind of a late bloomer anyways. Yeah. So, um, they're like, ah, oh, man, I just, just not ready yet. You're not ready. So about at about 20, my dad was going to send, now I'd always been in the ring. So it, it wasn't like I had to learn the moves. I just didn't know why I was doing moves. Right. So I just, you know, I could do any move. I just, you know, I've been doing my entire life. <clears throat> so and thinking of matches and actually helping my dad, like I was say, Hey dad, I, what if we did this and did that? And he's like, Oh, that's, that's a good spot. Like I would think of spots when I was a kid and tell him when he was in UWF, and sometimes he would use them, you know, he'd be like, and I'd see a, a, a thing on TV and say, oh, geez, that was my mood. That was my <laughs> That was awesome. But um, and then at 20, you know, he, Billy Robinson was wow. good, really good friends with my dad. My dad really, they really respected each other. And he was going to, my dad was going to send me to um, UWF in Japan. So it was like a three quarter shoot. Right. And then Billy was like, yeah, absolutely. Bring him down. Bring him down. And then at the last second, my dad's like, man, you're going to learn a lot, but you're going to come back beat up. They're going to beat you up. I mean, you're going to have cauliflower ears. You're not going to be this, what you look like now. So we backed off of that. And then at like 21, 22, about 21, we we're going to go to Mexico. And then my dad's like, oh man, he's like, they're going to kill you for the stuff that we've done. They can't keep, they can't beat us but they're going to beat you up. So we just had to wait. And Eddie was struggling through all that. He was 18 by himself, 20 years old and in Mexico by himself. Then my dad and my uncle Mondo actually went there and they all tagged for triple a. But before that, you know, Eddie was on his own. He said, man, he's like, they were, man, I was fighting every single night because, Oh, you're, Oh, you're a Guerrero. Well, you know, he says, shit, he had my grandfather's guys that were still around were, you know, trying to shoot on him and stuff. And, you know, so, oh, so well, that got to a point to where I was kind of like, okay, at 23, I said, that's it. I'm, 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 I don't care what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm wrestling. So I was training a lot, training with my uncle Mondo and kind of doing that stuff. And then at, at right, right at 24, I moved to El Paso. I left everything in California. I moved back to El Paso to live with Eddie and live with Eddie for 10 months, training, wrestling back and forth in Mexico, you know, as much as I could, you know, I was wrestling probably three, three days a week mm -hmm. there. Uh, and then, um, I got a, Eddie was in WCW. I got a call from WCW that their, their cruiserweight division had just taken off right. without the cruiserweight division. I would have, I would have gone there, but Eric Bischoff was like, Hey man, we're looking for guys. We just brought some guys from Mexico. We've got, you know, Hooventude and, and Ray and stuff. And they said, we need it. We need, we need some guys. So <clears throat> Eddie's like, Hey, I got a guy. Why don't you come check him out? So it's Chavo's son. So he brought me there, met, uh, met Eric. Eric was like, right away, like, all right, cool. Like, this is the guy. Well, I didn't know shit. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. So I wrestled uh, William Regal, Stephen Regal, 
and he made me look like a million dollars. He asked to serve with me as a favor to Eddie. He made me look way better than I actually was. Yeah, and, and he, could, he could have easily done the opposite. If oh he God, he could have beat me up, and he could have. I could have. That could have been the end of me. Yeah, he made me look much better than I actually was, and um, I got a job right there. Actually, wow. So yeah. ten months, ten months after I left California to go full full blast, I was in WCW. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what year are we talking now? Nineteen ninety five. Holy shit. Okay. Fuck, I didn't realize you were in there so long. So you were there right until the 2001, right till the end. Right? Until the end. Yeah. 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 So I was there for a good, whatever it was, you know, four years. years or five, five. I don't think it was six. I think it was five years. So I think we got bought in 90, in the end of 2000 or something like that, or something like that. It, it was something like that, but I know, yeah, it was maybe, maybe 2000, start 2001, something like um, I, I, that's yes. I was there the whole time. I went from seeing it as, I mean, the Monday Night Wars, man. Even right before the Monday Night Wars, we were we were on fire. WCW was on fire with the NWO when Hulk Hogan turned. You yeah, know, yeah. I was like, wow. I was just getting ready to come in when Hulk Hogan turned. I was like, gosh, dang, man. Am I ready for this? This is crazy. Right. And then they went on fire. We got there. We were kicking that WWF's butt. And then they switched to the Attitude Era. So a couple, about a year in, about a year into my my thing is when they really start they start taking off as well. So we, you know, we were we started becoming you know before when it was like okay, WWF, yeah, it was okay, but then as as we were there, that attitude era, we we're like God, this, they're they're awesome. And then we would do something cool next week, and they do some cool next week, and we were all rock and Austin fans, and you know it was it was pretty yeah, cool it was- to. That. It was such and, a fun time to be a wrestler, yeah. man. And then it went from being so, I mean, the ratings were so high, so, so great. And then I saw it so fast. I saw the demise of WCW. Just shoo. I saw it, I saw it die. Yeah. Just because, you know, they Turner didn't own it anymore. So it wasn't a Turner's blanket. Right. First time Warner owned it. Then AOL owned it. So, I mean, we had, I probably had four, four or five bosses while I was there, maybe more. In that in that years, so, I mean, first it was Eric Bischoff. He was he was like the Vince McMahon. He had the end all be all. But right. then when he let go. Then you know we had guys like, and not even Vince Russo and Ed Ferraro. They had a creative control, but they weren't the bosses. They had to answer to people. They were answering to the guy like uh, AOL guys and, and stuff. They had no idea what they didn't know wrestling. They just were high up in their company, and they said, "Okay, now you're going to be involved in wrestling." I was like, oh, "Okay." Right. Yeah. So I saw it just go, just, just, just nosedive. So in your professional opinion, you'd say it was the merger that really killed it. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we weren't, so Ted Turner, the story goes, and this is what we heard a lot of times. I didn't talk to Ted Turner on this, but I've heard that he, um, you know, he wanted, he at first had WWF on his networks, his TNT or TBS. Yeah. But then when he wanted more money and didn't really make a deal with, with Vince, Vince left that network, WWF, and Ted Turner says, all right, no problem. So he bought the NWA, renamed yeah. it WCW, calls up Vince and says, hey, Vince, by the way, I'm in the wrestling business. Yeah. Vince goes, hmm, that's funny because I'm in the entertainment business. Yeah. That's true. And then – they were running like WCW was was crappy. It was that was that was second rate. It was crappy, but they he wanted to compete, so he had the money. He was running out the big arenas and selling two thousand seats and curtaining off everything. This is Ted Turner on purpose. He was like, I'm I'm running with their running. Yeah, and then, you know, then you buy you know pay a check to you know Hulk Hogan. You pay a check to Randy Savage, and you start bringing people over, and then Scott Hall and Kevin Nash come and. Lex Luger and all these people start jumping and now there was another place to go. And then that, that took fire. And then he's Turner's baby, Turner's baby. So Turner's like, whew, he was a wrestling fan. He loved that stuff. So he kept it going, kept it going. It was huge. But then when he, when he sold, you know, time, time Warner and AOL, they started, you know, at Ted Turner owned everything in Atlanta. He learned the, or the Braves. He owned the, the uh, WCW. He owned um, uh, like, God, I think he owned the the Hawks and he owned the 
Um, Isn't there like a CNN tower too? That's his, right? Yeah, CNN. He owns CNN, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, then that was our home, you know. Well, yeah. then, uh, it's slowly but surely they started. You know, the new company started selling off. They didn't want to be in sports. They right. started selling off everything mm. and getting rid of it and getting rid of it. And sure enough, they, you know. Then you hear different stories. I listen to a lot of like shoot interviews, like Chris Canyon, may rest in peace. He was saying that there was lawyers that couldn't stand the fact that these like dumbbell wrestlers were making more money than her. And they were like, try to like renegotiate the contract to where, you know what I mean? Well, they were just before the agents. And um, now we had Hulk had agent, you know, NWO had right. agents, like, you know, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash agents. Yeah. But we didn't have agents. They didn't want, they did not, you're you only a certain tier could have agents and that's okay. just the way it was right um so they did not they they yeah i i won't name names but i remember that lawyer even saying like prince ikea one time saying uh he was trying to renegotiate his contract couldn't come to terms and she's like well, where else are you gonna go they don't want you up there like, get out so i mean that's her job but at the same time you know where's i don't know where they are now or he or she is now right. just, <clears throat> um, and Prince Ikea, didn't he win the lottery too or some shit? <laughs> I really like that. He was a great guy. Mike Hayner was a great guy. But yeah. I thought he already won some type of lottery. Now it was maybe not millions and millions, but he did all right. Yeah. Good for him. But he was a he was a great guy. He was yeah. a tough son of a bitch, though, too. Okay. So so WCW closes. But here's the thing, man. Like, because Eddie had left with with Dean and Perry and Chris. Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you had stayed back, so did you get any heat out of that from like Eric or whoever's in charge? No, no, no. So what happened was they were done. They were fed up, and they had just gotten really good raises and good, good. Um, you know, at least Chris, Eddie, and Dean did because they always stuck together. Uh, they always, um, you know, they they were doing pretty good, but they just got tired of the BS, and yeah. <clears throat> you know, they went from being a really awesome place to not an awesome place pretty quick. Right. Um, and you know, uh, they walked, and I was I wasn't on that show. And when they walked, I got a call from Eddie and said, "Hey, we just walked out." Eddie didn't even know. Eddie was walking in, and as he's walking in carrying his bag, Dean and Chris are walking out and saying, hey, "We're quitting right now. You want to come with us?" <laughs> and Eddie, went, Eddie goes, "He had his bag. He wasn't even in the building. Yet. He was had it rolled in his bag." He said, "Okay, turn around." Turn. Walked with, <laughs> walked with them. I mean, it was like it was. That's that's the truth. Turn out, uh, said all right. Eddie typically being late, just walked around, turned around, and walked out with them. <clears throat> wow. They all quit. So he called me, said, "Hey man, we uh, we we walked out. I think this might. I don't know for sure, but I think it's right before even Perry was with them. Okay. And then uh, he says, "What do you want to do? You want to come with us or not?" I said, "Do you have a a deal yet?" And he's like, "We don't even have a deal." And I was like, well, what do you think? And he goes, well, I think that some spots are opening up here. And I think you should stay and hone your craft, you know, kind of and get and get better. Because, um, you know, he knew I wasn't ready for WWF at the time. You know, I was barely ready for there, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I did. And I, I'm glad I did. I, I, I learned a whole bunch more. By the time I got to WWF, I was much more ready, even though... You know, the first year, I really didn't do much the first year. I had some matches here and there in WWF. Uh, I did Tough Enough too. you know, that kind of got me some exposure. But then when they put me and Eddie together, I was ready. He was ready, and it just pow, exploded. That was 2003, wasn't it? I want to say end of 2002 is 2003. Yeah, we were only together for a year. One year, and that's it. And it, all the stuff is w, as, as Los Guerreros that we did, that was one year. Wow. Yeah. And because you guys had a long, long program with uh, Haas and Benjamin, right? Before, well, before then, we were we did the SmackDown Six was me, Eddie, Benoit, Angle, Ray, and Edge. That was even before the wow. uh, the Haas and Benjamin. All those we had that was the angle that the big angle that we really had. <clears throat> I mean, we I mean we were a lot of people, you know, and uh, um, yeah, yeah. So it was it was. I mean, it was a year total. I mean, there was a time that I got hurt. I tore my bicep. So that took off like three months. But actually together doing stuff was a year. I think because I was uh, before I, I brought you on, I was thinking, did me and Chavo ever wrestle? 
And then we did. We wrestled in OVW. When they put it was a 2003, I think mm. that bicep injury you're talking about, they brought they sent you to I think OVW to train a little bit to get back oh. in ring shape. And then yeah. we worked. It was me and Sly against you. It was either Johnny Jeter or Chris Cage. Wow. Man. Yeah. I, oh, I can't yeah, I know. We have so many matches. It's like, I can't remember, <laughs> right? Yeah, wow. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was an OVW. I looked it up. It's on the internet here somewhere. If you look wow. it up. Okay, OVW. Cool. That's, that's news to me. I can't yeah. believe there's so many people that know all your stuff. Like, I don't know all the stuff. Like, Dude, they had this, people. what's this website called? Cage Match or some Cage, shit? Cage. Yeah, exactly. Every Cage. single match you've ever done. That's crazy. I had no clue. Like, um, James Storm from TNA one time, he was like, yeah, man, well, we worked before. I said, we never worked. And he said, yeah, I was an extra in WCW. Came in without the beard, short hair. Oh. And we, and there was a you. It was like, I think the Misfits in action was me, Hugh Morris, and, and Lash LaRue, I think, against him, like two other guys. Yeah. Well, really, I go, God, dude, I, I don't even really remember that. <laughs> Sorry, no, no offense. Okay, one question I want to ask. While you were with WCW, uh, were you a part of the crew that went over to New Japan while under contract and did tours? Yes, I did okay. the uh, two Super Junior tours over there. Okay. Uh, my first year in, so 1990, uh, start 96. I did two Super 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 Junior, the Super J Cup. How was your experience? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I, I love Japan. Japan yeah. was awesome. But that's my favorite style of wrestling. Yeah. But, you know, I had to get used to it. You know, that strong style. My uh, My dad... You know, my dad had been to Japan 30 or probably 30, 40 times. Your dad was a big star over there, right? In Japan, yeah. Um, he was the first one. He was the the uh, New Japan uh, junior heavyweight champion, and he didn't drop the belt. He switched companies to all Japan and took the belt with him. And you didn't do that back then. So wow. that was – you didn't do that. So he did that. So he had both belts for a while, and they, they, they did not like that, you know. But he um, – yeah, he was he was the first one, first one to kind of kind of do that and kind of just say f everybody, I'm I'm out. Right. Uh, but uh, so he was pretty big, and he uh, I called him up and say, hey, Dad, I have um, uh, a tour to Japan, my first tour. I, you have any advice? And I can cuss on here, right? You can do whatever you want, bud. <laughs> so he goes, uh, he goes, well, son. He goes, yeah, I do. And I go, well, what's that? And I'm thinking some nitty gritty. Okay, so when you wrestle, I'm thinking some stuff. You like some super insides yeah. rust insides and he goes he goes you need to beat the fuck out of him and i went huh like what do you mean he's like 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 you know get rough on him he was like no you need to beat him up and i was like oh okay oh, okay well my very first it's my first year in the business you know uh, you go from being you think you're tough and then you get into the ring with all these these actually men and you're like mm, i'm not that tough and you, uh, I, I talked locked up with uh, um, Kanemoto, Koji Kanemoto. Yeah. We tied up, went to the corner, my hands dropped, and he slapped the shit out of me. Broke my eardrum, boom, and I went, oh, oh, that's what my dad had wanted. So yeah. it turned into a shoot. We had like a sh shoot little match, and it was a shit. It's horrible, you know, because, you know, you're going to pro wrestle or you're going to shoot. It's two different things. So, um, you know, trying to work, but still shooting. And then they, you know, Japanese, they'll, they'll lighten up, they lighten up on you. And then the second lighten up, they uh, then like, Oh, we're back to normal. And then bam, they come, they click clock you again. So that's, <laughs> I learned to just like, Oh, well, oh, really? So just start bam, 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 bam. And then you learn some respect and then you just have some decent yeah. matches. <clears throat> but that was my, my trip, my introduction to strong style, but I love it. That's my favorite type of matches i mean because when it's done correctly and it's not you know i'm gonna try to beat you up you're gonna, you're gonna try to beat me up when it's done correctly it is it's beautiful yeah i got a a, a story about kanemoto so is he still <laughs> I, was, I, I don't know uh, he's still wrestling yeah he's this? still wrestling wow okay so i was on we we're working for a company called wrestle one right and mm -hmm. you know how you get to the shows like like three hours before right and a lot of the yeah. guys work out and stuff right yeah totally you get total workouts in well, I would usually get there and I'd go find a convenient conveni, go find a convenience store, get some food and you know for later. Well, anyway, I come back from the convenience store and I see all these fucking cops. I'm like, what the fuck? I walk into the front door, Kanimoto sitting there with his arms crossed, 
and I see a trail of blood where a fan is like holding his face full of blood. Oh, <laughs> I guess it was one of these smart marks who smarted off the Kanemoto, like, yeah, yeah, you're not in New Japan anymore, you're a loser, boom, and Kanemoto yeah. just beat the shit out of this kid. Wow. Yeah. They called the cops. Muda had to go have dinner with the kid's family so he wouldn't press charges. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Well, <laughs> Japan was, you know, and be you know, years before that, when my dad was there, you'd get away with that shit. You, oh yeah. I got them, they're not you're not, you know. Yeah. You, get, you make mean, the paper, you make the paper and they're like, oh, oh it's good for business. Well, it's like Tiger. I don't know, were you on tour with Tiger Jeet Singh back then? Or no. like Okay, well, yeah, they would hit. They would hit the fans with their swords, and the uh, Stan would hit them with the bull rope, and they loved it. It was Asai, Asai, um Ultimo Dragon. Yeah, uh, it was. I think the I, the the original Sheik. Uh, you know, he yelled at. He was a kid in the audience. Uh, Asai was. He yeah. yelled at him. She turns around and punched him. Boom! Knocks him down. And and Asai stands up. And is like. I took his punch. I took his punch. I took his punch. I took his punch. It was so excited. was so right. honored that yeah. he got punched from. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to sue you like it is here, you know. Right. You still believe because, you know, they would they'd still beat the crap out of him out there. So you have to believe. <clears throat> yeah, man. So, boom. We're in WWF. Uh, what I want to know is I left in 2007. How long did you stay after that? I left in 2000, close to 2012. Holy shit. So you were there for a whole another five years after I left, right? Ish. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So what, uh, what did you ask for your release? Did you? Yes. Okay. So I'm pretty proud of that. They're not proud of it, but I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> that, I, you know, you, this is the thing with, I mean, any company, big company like that, any big company is not just talking about wrestling, but any big company. It's not. <coughs> You get fired is when you get fired you know when they downsize when they let you go whatever it is whether it be microsoft whether it be apple i mean unless you're the ceo of the company and even then <clears throat> you know um you know if there's parts of the family you know the man family that don't rust that don't work for the company anymore you know so True. there it, it's it's just not if it's when you went yeah so i i just wasn't happy there anymore i i wasn't happy about the way i was being used but I get it. I, I, there, it's a business and you're making, you know, room for the younger guys. And now your job is to make the other guys look, you know, look good. And I, I, I get it. You know, I get it now. I just wasn't happy with that. I was happy being on the road, you know, back then we were on oh, the road, you know, fuck. 220 or 280 days a year. Dream. Then, yeah. The, I mean, one, one year when I was at ECW champion, I think I was home 65 days that entire year. Like 65, wow. 70 days. So that's not real conducive for a marriage or to be a father and all that stuff or even have a life. Right. So <clears throat> I just got to the point, and they don't rust like that anymore, which is incredible to me. It's awesome. Thank God they're, that they're like, they're, their careers will last longer, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I just got to the point, man. I just wasn't it, the, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze anymore. Mm. You know, and, and I had been thinking about it for a couple of years, like, you know, gosh, should I, I want to get out of here on a go. And before Johnny Ace had asked me if I wanted to be an agent and I, I wasn't ready yet. Well, then at this point now, I'm like, hey, you know, bring it back up to maybe, you know, there's an agent involved. He's like, oh, we just don't have a spot. Kind of blew me off now. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's the way it's going to be. OK, OK. Yeah. So um, I did, man, I just was done. And then one time. You know, they asked me to put over, um, um, what was his name? The Japanese. Sengara. No, the Japanese. No, that one. Well, oh, that was horrible, but uh, <laughs> it, was rough. it was rough. Yeah. Um, it was, they asked me to put over the, 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 the Japanese kid. Was it Yoshi? Tatsu? Yoshi. Yoshi. Yeah. And I love Yoshi. Yoshi's a great guy, good rusher, tough guy. But, you know, I just didn't feel like I, I was like, well, why am I putting him over? I think I should be he should be putting me over right now. Yeah. Well, they, you know, I could bring that to Johnny Ace. I could have a meeting with him. And it's nothing against Yoshi. I just thought that it's one thing if it was, you know, Nakamura, what he's doing now and stuff. No, it was Yoshi. And he was, they weren't doing much with him as well. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to put me to put him over. And I got like a Saturday night show or whatever. And I was like, I just, why is this happening? And I usually never, I did what I was a team player, did what was asked. 
All right, let's get that done. I may not really like it, but let's get this done. Okay, let's try to do my best of my ability because that's the way I was brought up. <clears throat> and at this point, I was kind of like, you know, hey, why am I doing this? Mm. Well, we have, you know, I think we, we, we're trying to build that jet, that Japanese market and stuff. And I'm like, well, why aren't you bringing in one of their stars to do the, bring their, their market then? If that's you're making a star. He now, is, of course, is a bigger star in Japan, but at the time was not. So I just was like, I just don't think that that's this is right. And so right there, I just asked my release. I said, I, I just, it's time for me to go. Right there in Johnny's office. And Johnny was like, hmm, well, hold on a second. Uh, I got to talk to Vince on this one. And so I went ahead and did business. I put Yoshi over. Uh, I did business. It's like they couldn't, they couldn't tell me anything that I didn't do business. Right. So I, I sat home for two weeks until finally Vince, Johnny came to me and said, well, we finally talked to Vince. And they, he agreed to your release under conditions. I said, what do you mean conditions? Usually you just give a release. Yeah. Well, you can't work, you know, certain, certain shows you can't work with these certain companies yet. You have to, uh, okay things by us. And I said, Oh, what's going on? Did you, did you realize that you just put, you know, 13 years or 12 years of TV into me and maybe you could have used me better. Is that what's going on? And, and, uh, I don't think he even answered, but I was kind of like, like what's going on. You're letting other people get their release yeah. and do what they need to do. But now I had stipulations. Why is that? So, you know, it was what it was and it was just time. It was yeah. time, it yeah. was just a time to move on. And thank God, because then I was able to do what I'm doing now. Well, I went to TNA for one year and that was just the TNA, the Dixie Carter's TNA was just not good. Um, and then I uh, left there, didn't really know what I was going to do. Went to, I got a call from Lucha Underground and they're like, hey, uh, you know, we have this new show, you know, Robert Rodriguez, this and that. So I said, okay, well, who's running your show? I'm like, oh, well, who's like, who's your director? Super? And they didn't really have him. And I'm like, look, so my, I had an agent because I was trying to break into Hollywood a little bit. And my agent negotiated a producer credit, producer for me. So I'm thinking, great, producer. Well, shit, I ended up running the show in a sense to where, you know, everybody had their, their spots. But I mean, I was, I was the one who's been in the ring been behind the scenes, doing all this stuff. So, of course, you had the writers like DJ, Chris Joseph, and yeah. and um, Chris Roach and stuff, but they never been in the ring. So they were doing their parts 100%. They had their their jobs that they were doing and kicking ass doing that. But I was like literally going, okay, teaching the camera guys. Like, they're Mark Burnett's camera guys, and they're great, but they never shot wrestling. So I'm like, hey, guys, we usually shoot it like this. We usually have a, a, a you know a, a, a cameraman here with this, and they're like, oh. All right. And then I was talking to like wardrobe and wardrobe. I go, you can't do that because, you know, they had, there's a sport. Why can't we have that spike? I go, because they're going to kill somebody. Okay, great. Talking to set, set design, you know, one time their set designer, set designer was like, I go, after the first show, and I go, wait, I go, wait a minute. These mats, these are four feet mats outside. These guys are flying outside the ring already, way past that. I go, we need eight foot mats. And she's like, oh, we're just over budget. We don't have the money for that. Well, as, I, as she's telling me, no, our, um, showrunner, because we had a showrunner, which because it was a TV show. Um, Eric Van Wagner was walking by and he goes, Child, what's going on? I said, Look, man, these guys in from Mexico, from AAA and stuff, they don't have anybody to sue over there. They get hurt here, they got Mark Burnett and Robert Rodriguez to sue. He's like, What do you need? I said, I need eight foot mats. He's like, Order them right now. They ordered them like right. It was that easy. They listened to everything I was saying. So I mean, I was talking to the director, how, how what camera to shoot from. There was there was the first season, I was calling I was calling the matches in my ring gear, stretching as I'm stretching, calling the matches. And I said, okay, guys, I'll be right back. This is what's going to happen. Blah 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 blah. I put the, the headphone down, go in the ring, go wrestle, and come straight back for the next match. Sweating, you know, hurt, whatever. Put my headphones on and then call the next matches. Wow. Yeah, that was the first year. It was pretty. It was pretty crazy until like I was the only agent. Okay. And we, then we started having Vampiro agent. Then we started having uh, a Conan agent. So then it kind of, it kind of, um, you know, just morphed into what it was, to what it was. But it was, it was, it was awesome because I, I, I didn't know I knew that much about wrestling. Right. You didn't know. I was like, but like, how do you know this? I said, I, I, I don't know. I was like, I guess. <laughs> You've been around your whole life. It just comes natural, right? I had no clue. And then I learned even more. And then I learned TV. And I took yeah. all the stuff I learned from Kevin Dunn and Vince and all this stuff and kind of applied it and learned more. And yeah. then uh, 
you know, that morphed into Hollywood to glow and stuff. And then I really started doing the TV. Okay. Paul London said Lucha Underground was his favorite company he ever worked for. Yeah. We, well, we first brought him in, I believe, as a, as a talent, if I'm not mistaken. And then we ha had him produce with me as well. So he was, you know, an agent for the matches as well. So he was great. He was, doing, he was killing it. Paul was awesome. I love Paul. He was yeah. We had some great matches in in WCW or WWE back then. Yeah, I had a good little program. But when he came in, you know, he had morphed and evolved, and got man, it got even better. Wow! Mm -hmm. And now you're Mr. Hollywood, right? You just <laughs> I guess I guess people call me that. I guess I guess it's um, if I found my little niche, right? And I found um, I was very specialized. In Hollywood, so not only just learning TV, but knowing what I know in wrestling. But it's not wrestling; it's TV wrestling. It's two different things, right? So what I teach, so when, for example, when I'm teaching, the, so the new movie coming out, um, Iron Claw, the story of the Von Erich movies, that's yes. coming out soon. But I'm teaching Zach Efron, and not to drop names, but I'm teaching him. Yeah, I'm going, guy. Okay, this what I'm teaching you. It's kind of like what we do in wrestling, but it's not. I'm not teaching you to wrestle WrestleMania. I'm teaching you to look like you know how to wrestle in a scene. Mm -hmm. Two different things. I said, but at the same time, what I teach like a seminar, like a pro wrestlers, doesn't work here. So there's two different things. It's both similar, but they're both very different. You can't just apply one to the other. Okay. Um, and, and and people couldn't realize that because we we you know have we have as pro wrestlers we have a lot of tricks up our sleeves and how to a lot of cheats we call it how to work the camera here and how to make this whole look like this but really feel like this and um so at one point in glow our one of my directors one of the big directors um he Jesse he was he goes hey man so you're you know God, it really looks like these these girls are, and even our, our stunt girls. God, they could. Do you think that they could go to you know WWF, WWE? I'm like, two different things, bro. I said, no offense, they're all athletes. They're very very good. I said, but it's two different things when you have, you know, um, Charlotte Flair kicking you in the face, like <laughs> for real. Yeah. You know, and you're you, all this. All this rehearsing stuff that we're doing in these scenes, I go, that we don't really do that in WWE. We just kind of go up there and wrestle. I'm like, what? How is it possible? I said, well, I may talk about the match, but we just, we're not, I, I don't, not rehearsing it for a month, you know? Right. Somebody just asked me about Logan Paul. I said, Logan Paul is doing great. He's, he's a natural. He's awesome. I go, but he's also coming in for one match. You know, he's wrestling three times a year or four times a year and coming in and rehearsing that match for a month. Like, we don't have the luxury of doing that. We're not, we don't do that. Right. I go, I'll do what he does by walking in the ring and going, you know, maybe yeah. call him finish. Okay. Maybe our spot. And then let's go do it. They're like, well, how is that possible? And so I, so I said, he's doing great. The, what he's doing, he should be having great matches for wrestling for, uh, you know, rehearsing for a month or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, enough, take nothing away from him. What we do is ballet. It's very, it's an art form. It's very, 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 very tough. Yep. You know? Yeah. That Tyson Fury, uh, there's an article that came out, the boxer, you know, he's from yep. uh, England. Yeah. yeah Tyson said, said wrestling's too hard, man. I'm sticking with boxing. Well, <laughs> any, any UFC person who've done both will tell you that. I mean, some of the UFC hall of famers and some of the toughest guys, I've ever been around and ever known like Don Fry and Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock. They say, Oh, all our injuries are from pro wrestling. They're not from, they're not from MMA and right. not taking anything away from MMA. He goes, but you know, he goes, I, I trained for six weeks. I fight, break my nose. And then I, I, I sit out for the next six months and right. recover and stuff. You know, he goes, um, um, Don Fry was saying, My bad back. The reason he's had to had stem cells, he goes, This from wrestling in Japan from New Japan. Yep. So I was trying to be Ric Flair and falling. Goes, That's why my back hurts. That's yep. why I have had surgery in my back. He says, Not from, from MMA. And they'll all, you know, they'll all tell you that. Anybody who's really good, Josh Barnett, Josh Barnett will tell you, Oh gosh, he's like, Now he's a, a, a phenom, he's a freak because he, he can just do both and keeps doing it. But he'll tell you, like, oh, he's like pro wrestling, man. He's like, That's that's no, that's no joke. We just it's a, it's a different kind of pounding yeah. as, as much as we do constantly you know i mean 250 days a year that's 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 tough and you gotta be a little cuckoo to do what we do you really you gotta, gotta, be. You gotta be you gotta be a little insane a little 
narcissistic, a little vain, a little to do what we're doing. You, you have to be, that's why we're all marks for ourselves. We're all a little crazy, you know? So like my, my friends, when I transitioned out of wrestling, my, my friends here in Cal California were like, God, you're, you're like, you're like insane. I go, me, I go, I'm the sane one in wrestling. Yeah, you're always like somewhat normal compared to like oh, other guys. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so they think I'm the crazy. Like, well, I was like, "What are you talking about, crazy?" Like, they're like, "Well, you, I mean, you know, if anybody, you know, starts shit in a bar, you're the first one. You don't care how big you are. You're you're backing them down." I'm like, "Well, I had to." I go, "I was in a locker room with six foot eight, three hundred pound monsters, and if you weren't as alpha as them, you're they're going to eat you." Yeah, that's just what it was, you know. So I had to be that that you know, that guy. And it was very hard for me to transition out of being that guy. It's still there, but man, it was really hard. It was hard on my marriage. It was hard on my being a father again. It was because you're still, you're, you're in that. I'm in the mindset that, okay, I come home. I rest up for two days, do my laundry, ch change my gear bag. And I'm back out for four to 10 days, whatever it is. And then I come home and do it again. Right. And now I'm home all the time and I'm like, all right, you just can't be that asshole anymore. How long, how long <laughs> you know, I get out of it, you know. We were so used to being alpha, 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 alpha. And I actually did some therapy, some anger therapy. And when I did, you know, the therapist was like, well, no wonder you are the way. Once we figured out how wrestling was and what we were doing, he said, well, no wonder you're, you're this way. You should be more like in a biker gang or off in Afghanistan or something, you know. Like, right. that's the mentality you have because we're just like, I don't know how we did it. I literally, to this day, I'm mean, sure to feel the same thing. Like, I, I don't. I was a zombie for 20 years. I don't know how I did it. And I'm just, you just go and you're hurt and you wrestle again and you're hurt and you wrestle again and you hurt something else and then you drink all night with Ric Flair and you travel, you fly to the next town and you just do it over again and over again and over again and over again. You wash your socks in the in the shower because you're on the road so much and you're, you're, you know, trying to get your, your gear back from not stinking. So you're hanging it up. You're trying to do the shout. You know, you know, it, it was, it was, I don't know. Yeah, we we're just, we we're insane. We're crazy. Yeah. Different breed, man. It was, awesome. Different breed. it was awesome. I loved every single second of it. It was amazing, but it's a young, it's a young man's game. It's True. Not, you can't, True. I can't be my age doing what I do now, you know, and <clears throat> you know, I, I also wrestle here and there, especially now that, W uh, that uh, Hollywood on strike, you know, with the Screen Actor Guilds. Are they still on strike? It's just, yes. yes. Oh. They came to terms with the writers, but they haven't come to terms yet with the actors and all everybody else, all the stunt performers. That's why. Okay. So um, we're still uh, coming, trying to you know, negotiate. So thank God I had some wrestling stuff to fall back on, some signings. I did some matches recently, and that's where we saw each other. Yeah. And because I, had, I really only do, I really don't do much, many matches again, but, you know, I kind of, pick some up this recently and people are like, ah, dude, Java, you're, you're still there. You can still go. And I go, well, I can go once <laughs> I can't do this tomorrow. You know, I can't do this four days in a row, you know, 16 times a month, you know, 20 times a month, 200 plus times a year that like we were doing. I can't do that anymore. Right. I go, but I can, I can wrestle now and I'm, I can wrestle again next Saturday. I yeah. can do that. Yeah. Hey man, we got like a big pile of questions here. You you want to go through these? Yeah, man, hit them up. up. Let's do it. All right, all right, Rex. Thank you so much for coming back. Hey Chavo, how much input did you have with your theme music? Did you ever listen to it while working out? So I absolutely never listened to my theme music unless it was on my walking out to the ring. But so I didn't have a lot of input. What happens? Kevin Dunn came to me, and I'll go quick so I can get through these questions. <clears throat> um, I had uh, Kevin Dunn came to me and said, Hey, you have some older music from WCW. Uh, it's a little, it's not digitized yet. We've, we've come a long way since then. We want to give you some new theme music. I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, so they came up with the, Ooh, Chavo, you know, dun, dun, dun. and when I first heard, I was kind of like, mm, it almost seems like I should, you know, I'm very kind of Mexican. I'm wearing a sombrero. And, and Kevin Jung goes, just trust me on this. This is it. Okay. Thank God. Because that's it. And that's the first, I hear, I'll be driving down the road and I'll hear, ooh, Chavo. I mean, it's uh, crazy. Man. I get requests on Cameo and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, can you start off with your ooh, Chavo theme music? And then, I mean, it's, it's crazy how much people, like, that is the song. So, Kevin Dunn, you knew what you were doing. Again. You know what? <laughs> 
a lot of people will say like this or that about the guy, but he's fucking smart, man. Look, you get in that that position, you you, you know you have to be you're, you you got to be cutthroat sometimes. You got to be an asshole sometimes to be in that position and to stay in that position because you know Vince. Vince likes alpha guys, so yeah. you get in that position, you kind of have to be that way sometimes. So I, I mean, I have nothing but good things to say about those those guys. I've, I learned so much from Kevin Dunn and Vince McMahon and Steffi McMahon and and Hunter. I learned so much from those and others. That I mean, they weren't teaching me. I would just watch. I'm a very good learner by watching and learn stuff. Like, oh, okay, that's how we do this. Okay, that's how we do this. Okay, great. And everything I'm really doing now is because of my family, but because of that that time in um, in WWE. You know, yeah. You know what to do, but you also learn what not to do. True. Yeah, you cannot work there and not learn something. Just hundred percent. You know what and, I mean? And, and I learned stuff from Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff is so smart when it comes to that i mean and it was so many different things but he really when i hear him talk he has so much you know knowledge about working with the networks and product shares and uh, and just so much different stuff that i can't even get into like he's just, i'm like wow like that that guy knows his stuff whether you like it or not and the we, they all make mistakes every one of us gonna make mistakes yeah and straight from vince's mouth he's told me he was a man i've failed more than i've succeeded but when i succeeded i succeeded pretty damn big so, you know, they're just a lot of times they're just throwing shit against the wall, seeing if it sticks. And that's yeah. what you do. But when it sticks, sometimes it sticks really big. So that's, you know, I've learned that as well. Don't be afraid to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to mm. fail. And that's just part of the game. Next question. Yes, sir. Oh, Joe. <laughs> Thank you for the years. That's you know what? Saying. Thanks, you guys. And that's, uh, I was never trying to be the cool heel. I mean, we were, me and Eddie were cool when we were doing, you know, Los Guerreros after we are our heel run. People don't remember the heel run, but they hated us. They hated us. And I was always like, I, I never, ever, when I'm a heel, I never wanted a fan to go, never do this to me. Like, um, well, he's an asshole, but that's a really great move. I never wanted that. I always wanted, you know, I came from the year, the, like your father's, generation yeah, yeah. to where i would i wanted so much i wanted to fight my way back to the ring to the dressing room every night sneak out that window that that need a police escort to leave the fucking yeah. building right i didn't have people if i didn't have a guy trying to jump the rail or trying to spit on me or calling me you know, derogatory names then i was i felt like i didn't do my job tonight right i literally felt like man i was i off tonight i didn't have i didn't have enough you know wet back or beaner jokes or whatever you want to call it. I didn't have enough of those. You know, I, I needed more because that I'm doing my job and I would instigate it, instigate it and have people hate me. Like, you know, so many times that people, I was just jump, man. Once you jump, you're mine. Yeah. You know, jump, just it. jump. And just, oh, ring, hey, yeah. if you want, I'll be in the, I'll be in the lot in the, um, in the parking lot afterwards. Just come, yeah. let me know, brother. And, uh, that, I mean, I was 100% serious. I, I wanted to fight every night. As a heel, though, you have to believe it. And if you don't believe it, the fans are not going to believe it either. And that's, I believe that I could win every single night that I could, I still believe it. I still, if I'm getting in a fight, I still believe I could win. And I've been proven wrong a couple of times, but <laughs> uh, uh, I still believe it. And if you don't believe that, they can tell in your eyes in two seconds. So Right? If yeah, it's well, real, they can feel it. Yeah. It's, it's real for me. I come from Fit Finley's line of wrestling, like the realness and the the work part, the shooting work was just this fine line, and we stepped over both ways a whole bunch. And Fit, I remember Fit saying, "It's so it's not this is not fake. This is real to me, and it is." Mm. <clears throat> hey, Hi, Chavo. What yeah. happened with Lucha Underground? It got me watching wrestling again. Love your work. What Lucha Underground wrestlers do you think deserve a shot at bigger stage besides Paul London? <laughs> so, uh, Lucha Underground was an awesome project. was my baby. I loved it so much. Uh, but sometimes you have a lot of cooks and none too many cooks in the kitchen, in a sense. Yeah. yeah sometimes yeah. you didn't know what to do with it. And, and it was an expensive show. It was an expensive show. Um, but it was the network's highest rating show as well. So when you have a highest rated show... <clears throat> You know, those decisions were made above me. We loved the, the ratings. The show, I believe, was amazing. We were able to tell stories 
And people, you know, we had a guy who was a spaceman. We had a guy that traveled interdimensional. A guy had a guy who was a dragon. But you, but because we did it in a TV show set, like like set frame, it worked. People, you believe, even though you believe, but you don't be like, oh wow, it was really cool. You know, it was really cool. It was almost like Game of Thrones with wrestling. It was just really just just different. It was really cool. Um, most of those guys have gotten shots, man. Look at all the guys that have, we had at Lucian Underground, as I say, that I had. But we had some other ones, you know, like, you know, uh, Conan, you know, was definitely a big part of that as well. He had a huge influence. Um, you know, Prince Puma, who was Ricochet, Willie Mack, Brian Cage, mm -hmm. um, the Lucha Brothers. Uh, I could go on and on with all of the, the Shane Strickland. All of these guys were all in Lucha Underground. So we had a big impact on wrestling, you know, and, you know, we had these guys were passed up from all the different companies. WWE passed up on all of these guys. We got them and we, we helped. They were already stars. We helped let the world see them as stars. Um, one guy that I, I don't see doing stuff and maybe it's his own doing is uh, Matt Cross. Yeah. Matt Cross is still great. Brother, I've been around the world with Matt Cross. Just I love that. Great guy. He's great. He's great. He's awesome. He was um son of Havoc in yeah. uh, in in WW and I mean Lucha Lu 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 Underground. So is that's it like, too nice. I don't know. I would love to see him be doing something on a bigger stage because he's he's a different talented guy. So I hope he's a great, oh, great person. Jonah, take this. I this is the part where I have to go to the bathroom. I got bladder like an 80-year-old man. I'll be oh, right yeah, back. Of course. Let me <sighs> right back. Yes, of course. Big question here. Uh, what's the story behind you beating CM Punk for the ECW title? Uh, that story <clears throat> of me beating CM Punk. So Punk was very, he was the champ in ECW. He was very cool. The reason why we started working is because he went to Vince McMahon and goes, hey, first he came to me and goes, hey, Chavo, you want to work a program here? And I was like, hell yes. He goes, man, I really, you know, Eddie was a big influence on me. And uh, I, I just think that we could do really well. So we went to Vince. Vince approved it, liked it. And originally, and this is Chris Jericho told me this because he was pretty high up there. He told me, he goes, you know that you were supposed to just have a program, small program with, with CM Punk. And they were supposed to put the belt on, when it was time to take it off, Punk, they were going to put it on Shelton Benjamin. They said, but because you guys work so well together, you got them. They put it on you. It was not the original plan. So that's kind of the how that happened and man i love working with punk and all the stuff going on with him now you know I, i'm not there i don't see it but i had no issues whatsoever when we worked together and we worked together probably you know two or three hundred times or hundreds of times we a long time for months and months and months and it, we never had a problem like literally not one issue we'd call most of it in the ring we'd go in there just go for it it was awesome i so i had no issues with it i had i i Wish we'd work again. That's how that's how much I liked it. <clears throat> oh, it's really cool to hear you say that. Wow. Um, a question about something in current day right now. I wonder what your thoughts are on the LWO with so much history of Rey Mysterio and, and just the thoughts on how they brought it back and branded it again on SmackDown right now. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it was a WCW thing. And I'm always to the fact that I like new stuff instead of recycling the old stuff. Mm. That's that's my personal opinion. I don't like I like I think you guys can I don't like Hollywood movies that are redone. Like when they redid Footloose, I'm like, wait a minute, I saw the original Footloose <laughs> when it came out, and you redid it again. I go, is this where Hollywood's at? Like just remaking shit? Like come on, yeah. let's think of new stuff. Let's make this let's, let's think of new stuff to come up in. and I mean, you could even do it uh, rebrand it to something else, but same story, you know. Um, I, I just um I I just I like new stuff, so I wasn't at first wasn't a fan of LWO. Um, this thing, God, really, they're doing this. I I think I like the all the wrestlers in LWO. I adore. I think they're all amazing. I just thought they could have been something better for them, but I think they're doing really well now. And now they're kind of pushing them. At first, they're kind of jobbing them out a little bit, except for Ray. Now yeah. they're kind of using them in in a really good capacity you know like and i i think that's that's awesome plus the theme song is mine and eddie's theme song it's it's mine and eddie's voice yeah the, the viva la raza that's mine and eddie's voice oh wow yes so i was a little pissed when ray came out lwo at uh 
at WrestleMania in the low rider that me and Eddie first started doing. And he came out. I was like, come on, man. Really? How would, right. really, how would you feel? I started coming out, you know, in a different organization doing, uh, you know, uh, it's calling it nine, four, nine and doing the thing, and wearing a mask and doing this. I go, man, I go, come on. And you, and now, of course, that's not his fault. He's just doing what is told to him and presented to him. It's a great entrance. Don't get me wrong. It was awesome. And in fact, uh, I had a lot of people coming up to me that when you heard that song, we thought you were going to drive them out. Oh, wow. And, and, right. And uh, it was, it was Snoop, which is awesome. Snoop, Snoop. Right. Right he's great i love him so it was really cool so <clears throat> so back to that question uh at first i didn't like the lwo and now i i'm i'm growing more fond of it i think they're doing a better job with them you think they're doing better with it in wwe than they did with wcw well yeah well wcw i mean it was too much cluttered stuff in wcw for that that was eddie's thing that yeah. was eddie's thing was it his idea and, um i think it was a mutual thing between between um, Vin, I know, Vince with Eric and Eddie. Okay. Um, and so yeah, for sure they're doing better in W in WWE with it because in WCW kind of besides besides Eddie, they kind of were jobbing the guys out a little bit, and they were doing they started doing that in WWE as well, and now you know these guys are actually you know, they're, they're in a good spot right now. I'd love to see them to get a much better spot, and not just Ray. Ray's always going to have a spot. But Santos Escobar and I, just, all those guys, I want to see those guys just like. Choo -choo. Now you got uh, Carlito with him. Carlito's going to kill it. You know he's he's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are we Let's, at? We're right here. Uh, this one. Yeah, you kind of cool. mentioned already, Java. But any memories of Paul London in, in WWE and Lucha Underground? Yeah, the piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I good. love Paul London. Paul London is he's awesome. I even like him. The stuff he's doing now way more. He's so good. He's so charismatic. He's taking all this. He's an actor in Hollywood as well now. Yeah. And he is really taking that and just keeps making this like, like lounge singer gimmick to where he sings this full on lounge singer song and then leaves and people think that's it. And then he comes out and Russell is great. It's awesome. It's awesome. But uh, yeah, in, um, in um, WWE, me and Paul London, we had a great program together. Yeah. And I remember, and I think I just talked to him about this recently. We worked this, this match, I was still the champ at the time, the cruiserweight champ, and I was going to steal it at the very end. So we, I, I think we went eight minutes of straight hard wrestling where he kicked my ass from pillar to post, from start to finish. He kicked my ass. I didn't do one thing. Anything I tried to do, he reversed me, and it was like, like um, you know, just false finishes and me falling out, him, me trying to run around and trying to stop him. I mean, it was the whole thing to where at the end, when I finally got him and covered him by a schoolboy or something like that and put my foot on the ropes and pulled the tights, that's the only thing I got in the entire match. I walked out. The fans wanted to kill me. Like, I'm not kidding. They were, the heat was so awesome. And they were like, you piece of shit. I got the only, you, the only reason you want is because you cheated. And so I'm like, well, well, yeah. <laughs> come on yeah and and they were so rabid like when i came in the back like one of our agents fit finley or whoever it was was like maybe our anderson because that's the way it's done that's what a heel does so it was really that's a great little memory of, of paul i loved working paul he was awesome yeah every time my name was next to his like okay it's a night off man oh totally totally pepe what the fuck was that all about <laughs> well, that was my idea as well for real yeah yeah so what happened was wcw gives a lot of leadway because they weren't worried about us they were worried about hulk hogan nwo right. lex luger that's who they were they weren't worried about what we were doing it just right. they didn't it just it just it wasn't a big thing so um i was doing a program with eddie and i was turning crazy because at the time like i had i we, we had a, a a match if i won the match against eddie he had to be a good guy uh, baby face. Well, if I, he, if I, he won the match, I had to be a heel and more take on his dastardly ways. Well, I was like, no, that's no honor. There's no honor in that and stuff. So, well, of course he cheated won the match. So now I had to, I had to be, start cheating it was, it was driving me crazy doing the stuff that he wanted me to do. Like hit him. I don't want to hear, oh, oh, you know? So finally I was kind of starting to get a little crazy and he, now I started scaring him off. 
So one time we were at his house and his kids were running around on this little stick horse. <laughs> and we were in Russell in Tampa that night where he lived. And I go, hey, maybe I should, I'm going to come out with that tonight. I didn't okay it by the by anybody. It was like, you could you imagine WC and WWE just walking out, doing a whole nother gimmick? Like, right. there's no way it would happen. Right. WCW, they're like, yeah, whatever. I just came out on a stick horse and I, I put like a Zorro mask on him, Zorro mask on me. And I was like, 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 like doing the whole stick horse thing. I did it one time. That was it. Just because I was crazy. The next week, I did not come out with a stick horse. And there was signs for Pepe because I had got the mic and said, this is my horse Pepe. And what's that Pepe? Oh, you, you know, so he was talking and stuff. And right. I gave him a personality. Um, there were signs for Pepe. There were stick horses. There was stuff. And I'm like, oh, no. And Eddie goes, well, I guess that's your new gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happened. That's so cool. You came up with that. And then how we got rid of it was my idea. Also, we got rid of him by having Norma Smiley put him in a in a wood chipper. Yeah, yeah. Well, because what happened was that again, they're not booking for us; they're booking for other people. So, yeah. our booking was getting. It just was. Yeah, yeah. Just have him do that. Okay, just have them have him beat him up with his gimmick. Okay, beat. so now people are beating me with my stick horse. I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense anymore. So one uh, thing, if I come, if I'm screwing people with that stick horse constantly no now people were taking it off and whipping me with it doing stuff now it just was stupid yeah well that was that was the to me the bookings fault well maybe they were doing that to me i was i hated it i was like, so i said hey how about we put him in wood chipper was and and have you know norman beat me up whatever and they're like oh cool i go but i have to get my heat back afterwards and how about i uh how about afterwards I, we do a pay-per-view match and I end up getting my, I'm, I'm beating, beating him back. And they're like, yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Well, of course we put the, we put the, the stick horse in the shredder or the wood chip or whatever it was. And I get my ass kicked and cake through because it was Pepe's birthday and the whole <laughs> crowd saying happy birthday to Pepe. And I mean, I had a, but then I got beat up, put face and just humiliated. Yeah. Well, the next week is the pay-per-view or two weeks later. And I, he's going over. I'm like, what, what the hell? That's not what we talked about. I go to the booking office and Nash is in there. Yeah, I think he was a booker at the time. And it's Macho Man's Macho's name of the booker. He's just in there doing something. And Miss Elizabeth is in there. And and I'm like, why? This is not what we talked about. Why am I not getting my heat back or getting some redemption? Right. And uh, they were kind of like, well, and then finally Macho Man, like, well, uh, you know, uh, I think you're at the point and it's a dangerous point to be in. Cause he always talked at like that. Right. And, oh, maybe not as flamboyant, but he really had that voice. No, you're kind of, un you can't hurt you. So anything they do to you, you still kind of come out on top, which is good, but bad because now they're going to beat you all of the time. And I was kind of like, well, sh fuck that sucks. Yeah, I guess that's not what I want to be in, right? And right. of course, Miss Elizabeth's there going, mm hmm, mm hmm. I'm like, oh, God, shut the fuck up because you don't know. <laughs> <what you're doing." laughs> but that's the soul. And I literally was like, why? And she was the same word. Like, mm -hmm, uh -huh. I'm like, wait a minute. Aren't you two fucking divorced? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> <I'm not talking. laughs> of course, I didn't say that because I was the young guy going, mm -hmm. right. went behind and told, you know, bitched about it to my friends afterwards. But yeah. I was kind of like, I still, to this, now I wish it was me. Now I would have been like, hey, no offense, but shut the fuck up. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yes, um, that's that's the whole Pepe. That's but they story. actually fucking, they copied it. Remember Perry said it had Moppy? Moppy, Moppy. Yeah. They even put it in the fucking whip chipper. So they're still your Yeah, idea. so they kind of, you know, they, the whole thing with recycling stuff with WWE, I don't like that. I think that's lazy booking to me. I just think it's very lazy and a lot of times they think, well, it's not really getting over. Well, no shit, because they've seen it already. Exactly. And then they'll drop it. So you kind of get screwed a little bit. They're right. sticking with the LWO. That's cool. Let's we'll see how long they stick with it. And hopefully they continue pushing that. But at first, it's kind of like, all right. All right, we've seen it before. Right. Right? So I hope they, they do something with us. You know, thank for, for the wrestler's sake, those, those guys are great. Yeah. Nice question here. Yeah, man. Good day, boys from Australia. Quick question for Chavo. Any memorable Undertaker stories? I love Undertaker. That he's one of my boys to this day. He's I could call him 
to tomorrow and he would not answer. <laughs> 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 he would uh, probably not answer, but, but, but call me back. Call you back. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's a great guy. He's, he's, you know, you know, takers, the, the, there's a reason why he was respected where he was at, not just because his work, but because of the person he was. Um, yes. I mean, I have some takers, some, some stories of him in the ring, great memories of, you know, just his entrance. You're in the ring. It's, it's amazing. It's the best entrance to me of all time. It's just so incredible when he comes out, especially with the guys with the torches and stuff. It's so incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, being put in a casket for the first time. That's a little, that's a little crazy. You got put in the casket. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I had many tip casket matches with him. I probably had you know, maybe four, maybe four or five. Eight was, that, was that during the SmackDown stuff with Vicky Guerrero? Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, was, so he was putting me in instead of putting Edge. They had a little thing yeah, to put yeah. me in. So, yeah, it's when we were doing La Familia stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I had some matches with him. You know, and he was he was great to work with. I would I would like to have done more of a program with him. I had a, a big program with Kane. And we tore the house down. He was so rad to work with. He was so great. I never got to do that with Taker to that level, but storylines with Kane were just, I mean, he we were just we had a really, really good chemistry in that ring. Really good. Um story taker stories is kind of afterwards. So one time uh at, at the bar, and I've told the story on on my podcast when I had it for a second, but uh, but it was we were the last day of the of the tour, I think it was Germany. Our hotel was across the street from the airport, walking distance, like literally walking across the street. So we all had to be up at a certain time and be on the. We had a charter flight. So well, we're all hanging out at the bar, and uh, Taker and I have a couple beers. I said, "You want a shot?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "That yeah. give us a bottle." Got a bottle of Jack. So we're kind of just doing half shots and drinking and talking and drinking. And oh, once that bottle goes down, I'm like, "Ooh." Man, he's six foot of ten. You know, he could drink more. Well, at that time, back in the day, he could drink more than any human alive, besides Andre. <laughs> he just guy he could drink. So, you know, we're drinking, and then we finished that bottle. I was like, oh, thank God. You know, I'm drinking. I was like, okay, let me just chill out for a second. Well, my dad's on tour when he was with us, and he puts another bottle of Jack in front of us, and I'm like, oh God. And I was like, oh my God. Like, well, I'm not gonna say no. So we're doing half shot, and then you know, he, he puts me to bed. I was done. Taker was fine. Well, I, I, I go, I'll pack in the morning. I'll pack in the morning. I got four hours of sleep and set my alarm. And I never missed my alarm ever. I think I missed it twice in 20 years. But it's due to was drinking. And I was so hammered, so fucked up. I woke up to my alarm going off and I'm going, oh, oh my God, it's been going off for an hour. If oh. I don't get that flight, that charter, I have to pay for my right, my way home. Right. Like that charter, like that you're you're on your own. So I'm like, oh my god, I haven't packed, and I jumped out of bed, didn't brush my teeth. I threw all of my stuff in the in the bag, like not packed, just just threw it all. I mean, it was scattered, just zipped it up, ran across. The, I didn't check out until I ran across the street, ran through customs, uh, not because through security, got to the and they were. I was the last one on the plane. Like they were like calling me. I said, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And so I stepped on the plane. Taker's in first, like, well, everything's first class, but he's always like in the first seat right there. He's sitting there and he's got his, his sunglasses on and he looks at me and he, and he goes, very cool. He goes, glad you can make it. And I just <laughs> looked, looked at him and I said, fuck you. <laughs> never drinking with you ever again. That's a great story. <laughs> and then, of course, I drank with him a lot, of, many, many times after that. But that was literally like, like I, I like you motherfucker, like dude, like I almost missed my flight and stuff. Oh, and then we were flying back to New York, so at, we had that charter flight that was the sports jets. Yeah, yeah. Every seat was first class. Yeah, yeah. So I jump in one of the last seats, whatever it is, and I'm next to an office girl. You know, I forget her name. So I, I lay down and I fall asleep, and I sleep for like eight straight hours. Just, you know, I put the seat back eight straight hours. I don't move. I don't have a meal. I don't have anything. I'm just sleeping. I've got my breath rinking, like racking, like, like reeking, like alcohol and blah, 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 blah. so as we get there, I, I kind of wake up. I kind of back to it. Like, Oh, okay. I just have eight hours. Like, all right. And she looks at me. She's like, like, are you okay? And I'm like, Oh yeah. I'm just tired from the trip. You know, and so I'm like, 
Never, never mind my brat. <laughs> you got a, you have a mint. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. That's true. <laughs> that's good. I'm gonna take a story right there. Yeah, man. Hey, Chavo, did Chris Benoit show any weird behavior before? Hey, listen, Chavo, if there's anything you don't want to talk about, we can skip over. Okay, but oh, go back to that real quick. Okay. So he was one of my favorites as well. I won't get too much into it. No, he did not show any, any behavior. If you've heard our podcast, go back to any of our, any podcasts that I've done or Jericho Pox, whatever. Uh, and they'll, it'll, you just listen. Cause it'll, it'll explain all that and say that he was the last person that any of us ever thought would do anything like that. So we'll go on to the next question from there. Yeah, man. Yeah. Smackdown 202 was great. Did you like working with Heyman? Uh, yes. So Paul was booking um, SmackDown at the time. That's when we were doing, like 2000, 2003, we were doing the SmackDown 6. He loved, and from I didn't know him this till afterwards, but Tommy Dreamer was in the office at the time and told me, he goes, you know, this after we that all finished and we were all singles and stuff again. He goes, you know, Paul Heyman loved booking for you six because he could mix and match any combination of you guys and you guys would have some of the highest ratings of the show, like no matter what. And I'm like, awesome. I go, they never told us any of that, you know, because I was negotiating negotiating contracts in there and stuff. I would have used all that, you know. Of course, I didn't tell you that, so you don't, you know, you don't get the contract that you want to get. But you know, you're always getting, you know, much better than working nine to five. But you know, uh, yes. But you know, that was a time when there was no there was no other alternative. It was they had WWE had eaten. WCW already and ECW. There was no, we had no stroke, no pool. So now today, <clears throat> when I talk to some of the guys and I hear what they're making, I'm like, first of all, I'm super crazy happy for you guys because that's what we should be making. I go, but I go, that's insane. I go, wow, that person is making this much money. That's three times, almost three times more than Eddie ever made. And wow. Eddie being who he was and, and the, being the championship run and all that stuff. I'm like, wow, that shows you how much money they were making back then because Eddie was, and I won't throw out numbers, but Eddie was making a certain, certain amount and as a champ and as whatever on his biggest year. And you have guys that aren't even in, you know, in this, not many people are in the same category as Eddie Guerrero, but aren't even can, you know, even in the same, same sentence in the same paragraph and they're making three times what he's making. So <sighs> thank God they are. I'm super happy for him. Um, I just, I'm, you know, kind of, you wish you'd get a little piece of that pie. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. <laughs> That's just being honest and just not trying to be bitter because we did make great money. Uh, and I'm really glad to see these guys making great, great money. So I'm super happy for the guys now. Yeah. Did you ever get a Uchava from the shadows while showering? And when you turn around, Michael Hayes comes out doing the moonwalk smile. Did you ever see Michael Hayes staring at you in the shower? Because Paul London did. Really? <laughs> oh, God. No, no, never. Never. I, <laughs> always, I, my, my dad had a, a big rapport with, you know, knew Michael Hayes from back in the day. So right. you know, all that stuff. You know, I, I, I knew so one time Steve Kern came up to me and there was an agent talking to me. Who name nameless? Okay. And as he walked away, Steve Kerman looks at me and goes, "Hey, you trust that guy?" And I said, "Are you fucking kidding me?" I go, "I got the scoop on all of you guys. I don't trust any one of you guys. I know exactly who you are and who you were because I know who worked with my dad. Was telling me about everybody, all of them. Watch him because of this. Do this because that guy's that guy's okay. That guy's great. So I was like, I don't, you know, I just I I knew who they were and who they used to be and the whole thing." Yeah. You know, some you know, some of the guys and who they were and who they were, who they used to be and people that aren't with the company anymore. So you can, you know, whatever, but you, right. you knew, you knew, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I always got along with Michael. Michael was cool. You know, Freebird, He was cool. I wanted to punch him a couple of different times, but, uh, so I'm did sure, I, I I'm, think sure everybody wanted, did. I'm sure he wanted to punch me a couple of different times too. Uh, but Hey, he was, uh, you know, when he'd get drunk, he'd go back to that free bird, that free bird stuck. And I was like, Let's do this, right, right. <laughs> you know, but thank God it never came to that because, you know, he's still a tough old bastard. <laughs> yeah. 
We got here travel classic as cruiserweight champ. Man, I missed your dad. He was so fucking cool, man. You know, I just got the other day. I did a, a signing somewhere, and someone said, "Hey, man, I loved how your dad won the cruiserweight title to where, you know, it was a three way match. Me, my dad versus me versus my dad versus Spark, <coughs> Spark Dudley. So, of mm-hmm. course, right before the the match, you know, the chef of vignette, me and my dad talking. Okay." We're gonna double team Spike Dudley. We're gonna be okay, cool. No problem. I'm gonna you're gonna stay the champ. Okay, great, awesome. Okay, great. So then in the match, somewhere happens to where I get knocked down and kind of out of it. Well, then my dad bumps into Spike Dudley and falls back on me. And as he's getting up, the ref counts one, two, three, and then and I'm still kind of out of it, kind of with it. And he's kind of like, who, who won? Who, what happened? And they're like, you won. He's like, what do you mean I won? So then they raise his hand. And he's like. I, I was just, I was supposed to win. He's like, I won. And, and I'm like, what the, what the fuck, dad? You just beat me. He's like, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I was like, so then he had his cruiserweight run, you know, to where it, it kind of like real life was kind of getting to his head in, in a sense to where, you know, he was, he's coming out with his, his ring rats were like these old ladies, you know, he's coming down the ra- <laughs> down the ra- these old ring, these old ladies and like he was a champ and, you know, he would have, you know, on his his door, his his private dressing room door would say Chavo Girl Senior Cruiserweight Champion, you know, real big letters. And I walked up like I did a vignette when I walked up and I see that and I'm like, what the fuck? So I go to open the door and he's like, hey, close this door. What? How dare you? Can't you? Don't you knock? And I'm like, what the hell? So I knock and he goes, who is it? I go, it's me. <laughs> I just walked in. He goes, hey, son, how you doing? And I'm like, what? Like. He, and then he like call him dad. He's like, no, I'm coming champ. <laughs> so it was, it was really, really fun. And, you know, unfortunately he, he fucked it up, <laughs> but he became, he went to the old wrestling ways that didn't work anymore in, in WWE back then, you know, you could do anything you wanted. My dad was a big rebel back in the day. He went to Japan a lot with Brody and Hanson and all those guys. So they were always like, you know, fuck the promoters. This is what we do. We're, we have the power. Well, at this point, the Russians don't have the power anymore. The promoters. Do. So, you know, he went back to being his own way, old ways a little bit. And uh, Vince had to say, uh, that's not how we do things anymore, Chavo. But I think he got, I think he was fired maybe three times from WWE over the years. Really? Yeah, three different times. My dad loved Vince. My, my Vince loved my dad. He loved him because he was old school and he was like, like, you know, like, fuck you. Like, like that's my dad. He loved my dad. But he also hated my dad because he was old school. Right. You know, it was like a love-hate relationship. That's my dad. And Vince loved the alpha males, the guys that wouldn't take any shit, the assholes. He loved that. But certain only certain people can do that. You know? Right. Yeah. Vince Russo, what's your thoughts? Thoughts on Vince Russo. So I get along with Vince Russo. Um, I hadn't seen him in a long time, and he came to Lucha Underground one time when we were still filming that. And I'm like, hey, Vince, what's up? And he's like, oh, Chavo, are we good? I'm like, yeah, why? He's like, oh, man, there's a lot of people from that era that, you know, just, you know, I didn't see him the whole time in WWE at all. So this is 13 years later. Right. And I'm like, uh, I'm like yeah, he's like, man, there's a lot of people in that era, man, you know, that I just, you know, I don't get along with. And I said, bro, it was what, what you're booking for your job. You're doing this. I was great. MIA, the misfits in action that we were in, I liked it because I wasn't doing anything at the time. This is after my run with Eddie. They Eddie left already. I wasn't doing crazy stuff anymore. I was just kind of a cruiserweight there. I was wasn't really doing anything. Then he puts us in a storyline, and we start having a storyline with Team Canada. And um, then we got uh, Booker came with us, GI Bro at the time, and <laughs> and you know they're they're using us. So you know you can't always. You know, if it was up to us, every one of us would want to be the champ. Every one of us would want to be Cena or or Roman Reigns or whatever. Every one of us would want to be the champ and the guy. Yeah. There's only one spot for that. So you kind of got to take what, you know, sometimes they, what do they say? They give you, you know, chicken shit. You make chicken soup. Right. That's, that's what it is, man. And, you know, there's, it just that's just how the business goes. That's how any business goes. But, <clears throat> you know, you know, if you're working at McDonald's and they tell you to go clean up. You can either bitch about it or you can go clean up and make it spark and clean. And they go, oh, this guy's freaking working hard. Okay, we're going to promote this guy. And that's how it should work in wrestling. It doesn't always work like that. But, you know, that's – you take what they give you and you kind of make it work. 
There you go, man. So no hard feelings against Vince Russo. I do like Vince. Bobby For all Lashley. the young wrestlers listening, listen to Chavo. He's been around. He knows what he's saying. A lot of wrestlers listen to this, Chavo. Oh, good, good. I hope so. I hope so, man. I got a lot of young wrestler uh, um, advice. Don't do the stuff that I did a lot of times, but, you know, some stuff like that, you know. Uh, any Bobby Lashley or Shelton Benjamin story? So, yeah. absolutely. Bobby Lashley. Tough guy. Very good worker. Freak of nature. Good friend of mine. I really like Bobby. Uh, I remember wrestling him in the ring a couple times, and he was just so strong. So one time we're, we're back at, and he was young. He was green in the business, you know. Um, we come back. We were the the match after intermission, so popcorn match, right? Everybody's still at popcorn. They're still at. They're still getting. Um, you know, yeah. So so they announce us. We come in the ring and. We're circling. He's getting ready to block. I'm like, whoa, no, 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 no. God, we got to wait three or four minutes and let me do my stuff. He's like, why? I said, people aren't in the seats yet, man. They're coming back from the session. They're still in the bathroom. And he was like, what? you you guys, you guys think of everything. I'm like, bro, we've, we just had some really good teachers. I said, wait, I'll tell you when. Okay. Okay. Now. And he was like, whoa. Should I go, hey, man, I'm selfish. If I'm in the ring and I'm wrestling, I want everybody to watch me. I want all eyes on me. So if I'm in the ring doing something and my tag partner is doing something down there and, and diverting from, from anything I'm doing, I will stop anything I'm doing. I'll wait for him to be done. Like, are you done? Okay, now back to my time. I'm in the one in the ring. They should be watching me. Same thing as I'm on the corner. I should be enhancing the people to watch him more, not taking away from that. So um, teaching that to, to Bobby. And then also another one that he doesn't like me telling, but I'm going to tell it because it's one of my claim of frames. Uh, we were out, uh, there was a time that we were all, we would all kind of shoot in the ring before the show and kind of do like a bunch of takedowns and that kind of stuff, you know, and see who the better wrestler was and stuff. And well, Bobby's, you know, freaking, uh, you know, all American wrestler, or, you know, uh, all, all American. he was in the army, wrestled for the army. He was just, Whatever he was, national, I don't know what he has got some accolades. He's really good wrestler and super strong. So he grabs me out to the side of my waist. And as he grabs me, man, I wizard down on him hard. I'm whizzing down, I'm whizzing, like thinking, okay, this usually works. He literally picked me up with one arm like this, shoo, and just held me there for a second. I was like, oh, you son of a bitch. So he puts me back down. I'm like, okay, okay, you proved your point. So then we start messing around a little bit. We're kind of going, he's trying to get me. I'm, you know, I'm pretty quick, so I'm kind of doing some defensive stuff, but I, I can't get him. He's just too good. So then he goes around the waist again, and I whiz her down again. So I feel it coming up again. And as he goes, all I did was, as I'm whizzing down, all I did was grab grab my wrist. So it's got his key lock. Grab my wrist and push on and uh, on his chest. And so I have his arm around my shoulder. So I'm, I'm hooking it here, key lock here, and I arch. And he goes ass over key tail. He goes Head over heels, boom. And as he goes head over heels, everybody saw too. But goes, oh, and his shoes fell off. His shoes flew off. So I don't know if he didn't have them tied or I don't know what, but both of his shoes fell off. This is the truth. They fell off. And everybody goes, oh, my God. You travel just suplexed him out of his shoes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason I suplexed him is because he was trying to lift me up, something he would never do in a, in a match. He's, right. And as he's lifted, he goes, Whew. And it was just perfect timing. And I rolled out of the ring and I'm like, that's it. I will never wrestle you again. Cause the last time I wrestled you, your I suplexed you out of your shoes. <laughs> and he was like, so pissed. Fuck you, travel. Get back in here. Get back. I was like, hell fucking no. I will never <laughs> wrestle you ever again. There you go. I suplexed Bobby Lashley out of his shoes. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That's, but awesome but that was, I mean, again, was just because. You know, because it uh, he <laughs> he was doing something that wasn't normally wrestling done. Uh, Mother Benoit, you always want to kick this person. Hey, look, this person, like, oh, Rex Gardner, you keep asking questions. Don't ask any more Benoit questions, please. Yeah. But I'll tell you this one. Hold on, let me let me just answer real quick. No, I didn't read that. I would never read that. This is not my business. And if anybody reading somebody else's diary is probably you shouldn't. That's their thoughts. Their personal thoughts. They didn't put in a book. Put in a diary. It's a uh, um, a letter to themselves in a sense. So no, I did not. So I, obviously I think this person is a little fascinated with the manual stuff. So just read up on it. Check it out. Check out what we did on dark side of the ring episode one and two season two. Uh, 
Um, I supervised, produced both of those episodes because they had approached me and said, Hey, um, you know, we want to tell a story. I'm like, I'm, I'm done telling that story. I'm just, it's, we've been beaten to the ground. I'm not telling anymore. And we kind of went back and forth. So we negotiated. I go, look, if I'm going to tell it, well, I'm telling it as, as I need to be involved heavily. So I was able to get all the players that were involved with me, Dean Malenko, um, Vicky, Eddie's wife, um, Chris's oldest son, David, and Nancy's sister. So, um, Sandra, we told our story. We told the real story of what really happened, or at least what we believe really happened. And now we're putting it to bed. I've been asked several different times to either do another episode of something or start a book or something. And I'm like, nah, it's done. We put it to bed. We're not telling it anymore. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's good, man. It's good. Yeah. It's been, you know, good. Diet Chavo. All the taste, half the fat. You remember that. Okay. So that was, so he says, what was it like with your dad? I love Chavo Classic. The match with Funaki, where after he won, he got sworn by five ladies. It turned out he paid them off. Okay, so great again. So um, that I said that one time I was doing commentary at for one of my dad's mess, matches because they brought him in to be my manager, but then he ended up starting doing some wrestling stuff. Right. So they were calling him Chavo Classic. Um, yes. Michael Hayes gave him that name. Chavo Classic, because it was Coke Classic and regular Coke back then. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or the new Coke and Coke Classic. Well, they started calling him Chavo Classic. Chavo Classic. So a play on that, I said, yeah, he's Chavo Classic. I go, I'm, but I'm like Diet Chavo. I go, I'm, I'm uh, um, all the talent, half the fat. Because <laughs> 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 a diet, diet. So, so they, they said at one time, people remember that. It's funny. Um, working with my dad was awesome. He was Dream, it was a dream come true. It was tough because my dad was my dad. As you know, your dad's your dad. It's a very, they set in their ways a lot of times. Yeah. But he was, um, he was awesome to work with and it was a total dream come true. And, and like I said, and going back to his ring rats, you know, all the good, the, the, these old ladies came home, came down and it was, it was really cool, man. He, we were having a lot of fun with it, you know, and even the, the people in the office would comment to me all the time, man, we, we, we love watching what you guys are doing every week. It's, it's really yeah. cool. So, that was a fun time. I wish that would have lasted and uh, we would have played that out more. It would have been great. Victoria or Melina? Victoria. Who, oh, Victoria. Yeah. What, what's the, uh, is that's, that's the question? Victoria. Any, story, yeah. any, any thoughts of Victoria Melina stories? Oh, I love them both. I, I've, yeah. I was traveled with, with. You were uh, always traveling with the girls, man. Well, <laughs> hey, you know, come on, come on. <laughs> no, no, no. I traveled with, with two girls. I traveled with, uh, Victoria, this is Lisa Marie, Victoria, yeah. and Candace Michelle, because mm -hmm. they were, but and then we kind of just it hooked up, and I, you know, we talked to each other's husbands and stuff, and go guys and wives, and said to guys, uh, this is just, and they're, if anybody knows those two, they're, yes, they were extremely beautiful, but they are like the guys, like they're worse than the guys. They're farting, they're picking their noses, they're telling them they had to stop and grab some wine. I'm like, what the hell are you guys? This is like, I'm, a, I'm picturing these divas like these you know these no god no they're 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 worse than the guys so uh driving with them was awesome we had so much fun together and they're still two of my buds because of that melina i never traveled with her because she was with uh morrison at the time and right. doing stuff with eminem uh but god she was awesome how hot was melina when in wwe i think do the splits and stuff she was awesome great wrestler Great valet. She was she's run great. I love Melina. That was a great fucking entrance on huh? the splits. One of the best. I love it. Wow, that's fucking so good. hot as shit. All right, Kerwin White. Does that bring back nightmares for you? Kerwin White. You know, it's the same thing. You got to make uh, chicken, chicken salad, salad or chicken, chicken salad, shit. Chicken shit, yeah. man. And <clears throat> what that was was, you know, hey, you got Vince throwing shit against the wall and seeing if it stuck. Right. Look. So. So. You know. He felt that I was wasn't doing it like my character stuff. So he thought enough about me. So let's 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 flip that around. Okay. He thought about enough about me to say, hey, you know what? We want to repackage Chavo a little bit. We want we think Chavo could do this, pull this off. Right. So he had me. I mean, I came back from a trip from Japan where I landed, went to Raw, and he was like, "Hello, Kerwin." 
in his deep voice. And I was like, uh, hi, what does that mean? He goes, well, <laughs> uh, today you are denouncing your Hispanic heritage and you are becoming a white guy. <laughs> awesome. Let's do it. So I look at every character as a movie role. So if I'm playing, let's say, a white guy, a yeah. white racist guy, or a white anything in a movie as a movie role, that's not really me. It's just what I'm playing on TV, right? right? That's the way I looked at what I was doing for WWE. People was very hard to blur those yeah. those lines were blurred and very hard for them just to focus and see what it really was. Right. Okay, I'm a Guerrero, Hispanic, saying Viva la Raza. I'm not really going to denounce my Mexican heritage, but people want to believe that. So I'll let them believe that. And I, man, I was trying, I was trying to get heat from everybody. So I was getting heat from the Hispanic So I was denouncing my heritage. Right. Getting heat with white people because I, I'm white. You're not white. Oh yeah. And I was dressing super over the top, like pastel yes, off clothes and yes. just we're like, we don't dress like that. Oh yes, you do dress like this. <laughs> In front of everybody, and then I would wrestle just like ethnic, like like you know, black and Asian, and anybody who wasn't white. You know, I was wrestling those guys. So, and I wrestled Shelton a bunch, and you know, and and, and I mean, I changed my my stuff that I was doing back then. You can't do now, but back then, I mean, I was saying, you know, my catchphrase: if it's not white, it's not right. You know, I was saying my change my my uh, finisher to like a rolling half crab, and I was calling it the white out. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. And so I, I mean, I was doing some real racist stuff and I told Vince, I had a meeting with Vince. I said, look, man, if we're going to do this, I want to do it. I want to go all the way with this. I want to eventually come out in a white sheet, like, like Ku Klux Klan. So I want to do, I want to go full blow. If we're going to do it, let's do it. And he was like, Oh, this is a great, I love you Guerreros. You, you take the bull by the horns and you, you're not afraid of any heat. This is what I like. I wish everyone was like you it's right from Vince's mouth. So we're going to do that, man. And, you know, you got networks now. You're not Attitude Arrow anymore. Right. Now you're network stuff. You Now you're doing stuff, you know. And if back in the day in the 80s, and this happened many times to where you'd have a white wrestler, like a, let's say the Freebirds were doing a very Southern gimmick against black wrestlers. And one time they, it wasn't them, but somebody, they grabbed and hung them over the rope, over, over the ropes with a rope, like in a noose and, uh, you can't do that anymore. It was very, very unacceptable. And it was unacceptable back then, but it just the lines were just different back then. So, um, you know, the, the way, you know, wrestling is, it's characters, man. And, and the characters I did were all, you know, not me, me, because this, who I am right here is not going to sell tickets on uh, in WWE. You have to become a different person in a sense. So my Chavo character, that was, that was me, but it was, just ex super accentuated. Eddie didn't walk around going, hey, Vato, what's going on? Hey, but that wasn't Eddie. That was Eddie's character, and Eddie could do that, but Eddie was very humble. You know, Eddie was a very humble guy and one of the nicest guys around, big Christian, and always reading the Bible to you. And really, man, he was just really gave a shit about you, was really a great guy. He wasn't that character that he was in TV. So, you know, it'd be like us saying, well, what about – Edward James almost playing, you know, American me, that show. And he was a big gang leader of the Mexican mafia. It was a role. That's not him. So that's the way we look at it as well in, in, in wrestling. It's just a role and embrace those rules because like uh, to all the new wrestlers out there, the young wrestlers. Yeah. It's still called wrestling. So you have to learn how to wrestle, but triple H and this is from triple H mouth. He's not looking for the next great wrestler. He's looking for the next great entertainer. That's what we do in the ring. We entertain, we tell stories, and we use wrestling to do that. That's what we do now. Very well said, my friend. Yeah. Good to see you, Chava. Rene has been saying for weeks that he could beat you with both hands. See, this is a little shit disturber we got here. Oh, oh, from Canada. I have Rene is a phenom in himself, and when he came up to WWE, what were you, 18? Uh, 19. And you looked like you had a body of a, a body. people with 35 year old bodies don't look like that. Like, yeah. like well, how old is this kid? This is insane. How is this even possible? Yeah. So yeah. So he's a phenom. So I yeah wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't mess with Renee or anything. <laughs> Jesse Gordas. Who I never. Oh, who sure. is he? 
Jesse Goddard's. Goddard's. Jesse is, Everybody. uh, I think he's the OVW champion now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I knew, uh, Jesse from doing some stuff with TNA and he was the, the big brother champion, I believe he was. So he's like one famous guy from, from that TV show, big brother. Uh, Jesse, great guy. I love Jesse. Another great, like uh, just a, a, a physical specimen. He never misses a workout, you know, just, he doesn't miss his diet. Just, he's just, he's spot on all the time. Uh, he was great. I even brought him in when I was doing some stuff on uh, Snowfall and brought him in as one of the characters because he was breaking into some acting stuff. So we brought him in, did some work together. So he was, he's great. I love it, Jesse. <clears throat> um, okay, so there's a debate about this. Did Vince really treat all the WCW guys like shit, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think so. I think he's just looking for at money. Now, you own a wrestling company and the head of the old, the other wrestling company is saying that he's going to put you out of business and almost did. Yeah. Put them out of business. Yeah. And now you own that other wrestling company and that ex boss works for you now. And all of these wrestlers work for you. So are you going to make them the star stars over your stars? Probably you not, yeah. but you're, Probably, you know, let's say this makes money. Uh, Vince's favorite money, favorite, favorite color is green. Yeah. So, who can we make? Let's weed out these people. And if you yeah. recall, only like nine out of the two hundred plus contracts that were in WCW, I think only nineteen of us got brought over. I'm not sure if that's the correct number, but very, very few people. Very few. I was one of them, and in fact, to my horn, I was the very last one under the original con that they first brought over that came that was left in WWE when I when I left. That was the very last one. Now, like Booker had left but come back. Stuff like that. Mysterio never came over on the on the first initial contract pickup. So there was some asterisks in there, but I was the very last one, the original one that just stayed there the entire time. <clears throat> so Vince McMahon, he's gonna who could I draw money with? He doesn't really know these guys. He's not really watching that product. He's worried about his own stuff. So he said, like, okay, so let's, how can I, who can I sprinkle in? Who can I start using guys? And little by little guys started rising to the top, you know, um, Booker T for instance, Booker T right away, man, he was, you know, he was a man. Booker T's he's, he, he proved how good he was and he got even better, uh, you know, in, you know, WWE, WWF. Uh, so did he treat us like shit? I can't say that. Um, we just had it on our spot again. It's what it was. You had to work your ass off, and the stuff. And Eddie told me one time, all the stuff that you've done in WCW, you have to start fresh here because there's not a lot of crossover fans. You have some that don't know you. There's a lot of them that have never seen you before. So you're starting fresh, which is good and bad. So uh, I just think Vince did what he had to do to, to make some money. That's it. Chavo <laughs> podcast. Was we'll not ass kissing Vince's. Kissing Vince's ass. I'm just telling you, like it is. I think that's. Yeah, that's yeah, he's, a, he's a businessman, and his favorite color is green. You're right. And that's when I do a like, seminars and I tell young wrestlers, and I say, "You want to make it to WWE? I know how to do it. How? Figure out a way to to make Vince money. I, I keep saying Vince because Vince is still part of it. I don't know if it's who's owns that anymore or whatever, but. You know, you figure out how to make him money, you're going to make money. It's like we're going to any other job. You go to Starbucks, you go to McDonald's, you go to a restaurant. They're not in the charity business. They're in the money-making business. So when they hire you, you got to be an asset to the company and be able to make them money so they keep you. And you can, and by doing that, you continually make money. Um, Rusty's no difference. He's not in charity business. He's not giving you a... Contract just because he's a nice guy. He's giving you a contract because he he needs to make at least ten times what you're making. Make that back. Yeah, at least. So, and even if you're only making ten times, you may not be making enough. Maybe you're not be worth it. So that's that's what wrestling is. Wrestling is a business. It's not it's not a sport. Any but any sport is a business. Any any pro sport. Once you start making one dollar on a pro sport, it is no longer a sport. It is now a business. Look at the UFC. Uh, Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor, we know that he's not the best fighter anymore. Was he great? Yeah, he's awesome. He's, we know he's not the best fighter anymore, but he draws the most money. He's going to come back and get a title shot. 
right away. Wait, and he's going to bypass a lot of people that have been there going to get title shots. Why? Because he sells tickets and puts asses in seats. Like Period. Brock. Brock lost his first MMA fight or UFC fight, and then the second fight, it was a championship title match. I don't How know. does that work in a real sport? Because he put people, yes. Because he sells tickets. Yeah, but it's not a sport anymore. It's a business. It's a business. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that, once you treat it like a business, now you're in the right mind frame. Now it's a business that you have to keep in shape and you have to, you have to learn your craft as well, but you got to figure out how to make the money. And that's it. The, that's it. Yeah, yeah. What's the status of my podcast? Okay. So uh, my, I had a podcast called suplexes and cervezas with Chavo. Uh, cervezas meaning beer suplexes. And so it was a, I, I have my own beer called Los Guerreros Mexican Lager. Do you? I do, and it's awesome. It's right here, baby. There it is. It's from a Lobster Brewing Company in California. It kicks ass. It's the I best it. Mexican. It's called a Lobster Brewing Company, Los Guerreros. So if you look at the the artwork, you see Chavo. Oh. These are a bunch of wrestling moves up there. So it's kind of like a play on That's wrestling. Cool but wow. Yeah, really cool logo. It's, it's won tons of awards, not only tasting awards, but label awards can awards it's won a lot so um it's just a play not to plug that but that's it's a play on my wrestling and my beer life type thing so um suplexes and cervezas with chavo it was great i loved it i had some big actually some big people on there um you know i had not just wrestlers like undertaker and um you know kishi and ray mysterio uh i had you know presidential candidates like um andrew yang I had comedians. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, Gabriel Iglesias on there. And P just, it, what it was is people that I I, I know because and that I'm doing – it's almost like I'm you're riding in the back of a car with it. We're just telling stories. Mm. That's, you know, that's kind of what it was. People loved it. It was really good. I wasn't really happy with the podcast company that I was with. I just felt they weren't giving me the support that I thought I needed that I could do really well with. So I wasn't ready to start like, hey, let me prove myself. I was like, okay, I'm just, I shut it down for a little bit. It's not, it's not going to come back. It, it, you know, if I get the, anybody listening out there, a good podcast company that just check it out on anywhere your podcasts, you listen to podcasts and tell me if we can do it again. I, in fact, I had a, a, a big actor, I won't say his name, wants to, do, wants to do a podcast with me. He's like, hey, you want to? think we would do a podcast together and i was kind of like yeah man um I'm sure if you if we i think we could if you want to start you know want to piggyback off each other and start doing it, i think we could kill it so i don't know we'll see dude maven came on here a few times and then yeah. some youtuber contacted him now he's doing fucking videos he's fucking killing it dude What's for maven i love maven's a great guy maven's a good dude yeah. maven's a good dude any yeah, members was of working with the world's greatest tag team, Charlie and Shelton. Yes, definitely. I heard you guys got, in, got into it a few times. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Those guys were two All-Americans. Yep. Green All-Americans. Strong as shit. Tough as nails. So we were fighting in there a lot. Um, but we got to the point that, okay, we started trusting each other. They started trusting us more. We started trusting them more. And then we had some really good matches together. Some really good matches <clears throat> to where, I mean, we had a lot of fun together. Charlie and Shelton are both great guys, great wrestlers. And, you know, just, um, man, we just, I loved working those guys, you know. I mean, after we got through the the teeth pulling part of it, it, it was great, man. They were, they were awesome, man. It was really cool to be in 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 rings with that caliber of athletes you know and and you know in pro wrestling eddie and i were the men so we would you know shit we would we <laughs> we didn't we didn't pose our our will at times you know and i remember one time um, you know these guys are two all-american wrestlers and we we're like i'm gonna blow them up so we were like ah, bam bam going like crazy and calling shit and having her coming in and we were just having you know falsies and different stuff and as we got done we were all tired they were selling they've got up there <sighs> and me and eddie come up, <clears throat> didn't sell it. We're like, hey, you guys are right? And they're like, yeah, wow, what a match. I'm like, what's going on? Why are you guys breathing so hard? I thought you were all Americans. 
fucking pussies, man. And we kind of walked by and they're like, fuck you, man. Well, we're tired as hell. We just didn't sell it. We went in the back right. puff and puff and like, oh my God. <laughs> but we didn't sell it to those guys. And it's just being the veteran stuff, doing stuff to young guys, the same stuff that the veterans did to us. And we, yeah. You know, you fuck with them a little bit, but they were great. They were, they were awesome. Did we get into it a few different times? Yeah, we did. But hey, we're, we're better because of it. We're actually closer friends because of it. Uh, I'm just going to go over just the $5 and above questions because I don't want to take too much of Chavo's time. So, been a fan for 30 years, watched every episode of Lucha Underground. I still don't know if I should trust Conan. <laughs> well, that feeling is in wrestling as well, but uh, Conan's a great guy, man. Conan, you know, the, the, the years of, you know, watching your back and, 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 you know, really just watch out for yourself and being a cutthroat. Let's just, let's just, when you get older and he's in the same spot, you just get, you get over it, get over it. You're tired of that shit. You know, you just want to make wrestling better. And he's at that point that he wants to just make wrestling better. And then the fact that he came out with and told the world that he was, has bi bipolarism and he's bipolar. And after he said, cause we were doing the big, um, with Gail Kim and stuff. And we were doing the big, uh, um, mental awareness and doing like, you know, just like really worrying about, uh, I'm just saying it wrong, but all the, the issues with, with mental health and stuff. <clears throat> and a lot of wrestlers came out and say, well, you know, this, I was diagnosed with this or this and this, a lot of wrestlers started coming out and he came out and said that he had, you know, bipolarism and, and, but you just, back then you couldn't tell people you're bipolar. People didn't know what that was. Right. You know, like, oh, well, you think you're weird. So I called him afterwards. I go, bro, I, I thought you were just being an asshole a lot of times. I just thought <laughs> a lot of times you were just an asshole. And he goes, man, I just, and I said, go, oh, man, I'm sorry. You, you, you get tired. You get done with, you know, with a chip on your shoulders and all that stuff. And you just get older. You get over that shit. You just want to, like you said, make wrestling better. Yeah. That's what I do, yeah. Yeah. Why can't we all just get along, huh? That's it, man. Thoughts on Crash Holly? He's one of the great. great man, I love Crash Holly. Was so thoughts on Crash Holly is one of the best underused small guys. He was. He was great. Crash was great. I love Crash. He was crazy. That dude could. He could. He could go in the ring though. Really cool yeah. guy. I never had one issue with Crash. Uh, I felt sorry with him for him because he was uh, uh, Bob's partner for a little bit, and uh, and you know Bob, <laughs> if you're not, uh, you know Bob will fuck with you a little bit. But he's, yeah, uh, uh, yeah he was a. Uh, uh crash is a good dude good dude okay i gotta go back the bladder is acting up jonah take over five and above yeah. Greg. Okay. five and above that's it just the exclusive ones did you enjoy tagging with shane helms versus paul and brian that cruiserweight division on smackdown didn't get a lot of love but it was fire thanks for the memories i agree Definitely. yeah absolutely all of those guys were great you know paul london billy kidman yes. Jimmy noble all oh, that 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 cruiserweight division was on fire as well um WCW Chris Wood Division that was awesome because that you know started the whole thing off and we love doing that. Um, but we really all really learned to really really work in WWE. So uh you have that group really get, having the level even get higher and better. So wrestling those guys was great, man. I, I had so many good matches with all those guys. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um we've got one here. Uh, Charles, thank you. What was yours and Eddie's feeling and emotions after he won the WWE title from Brock Lesnar and beating Angle at WrestleMania 20? Oh, man. That was so great. I mean, that put, you know, they say you're not a wrestling, well, you're always a wrestling fan, but not as a wrestling family. You really are put on the map when, you know, when you bring the world championship home. And that's, you know, what that Iron Claw movie is kind of about that with the Von Eric movie and, that, you know, that, that, having that NWA championship in their family, put their family more on their map. The hearts having Bret Hart as the, the champion of the world, you know, the, not just the world champ, but like the organization, that's the biggest organization and that champion uh, that puts you on the map, man. And it really does, you know? So when Eddie won that, you know, we still stayed in characters. So my, we had my dad and I had turned on Eddie and we had a big feud and then he went off and was, Russell Brock and stuff. So when he won the championship, he came through the tur curtain 
and we, you know, we still treat wrestling like it was done back then with kayfabe and everything because they were filming. They had cameras backstage filming his reaction, ever all the boys' reactions, all this stuff. And I did not go up to him, even though I wanted to. Everybody was congratulating and stuff, and I did not go. I stayed far away from him because that's what you do. And I respect this business. And you got to we k. I hate the fact that kayfabe is so dead. Mm. But we didn't talk to him. I didn't talk. And then when we went to the dressing room, when there was no cameras, we closed the door and we hugged and we cried and we just, that's what it really happened. But you just like, you know, we, when he and I, when we had a feud, we're brothers. We, you know, we have each other's backs no matter what. We couldn't ride together. together. We stopped riding together. We had to. That's just the way, you know, wrestling, you know, you should, it's like it still should be. You still got to keep, if you're not doing that, you're working against yourself a little bit when you have this big angle that people want to believe and they see you got to heck hanging out at the bar together. Yeah. Sometimes it meant just working against yourself. So I'm trying to make myself, make it easier on myself. So, and not do that. So when people were really believing that feud that I, Eddie and I had, and in fact, when I turned on him, Vince came up to me and we worked Vince. Vince was like, man, I, I don't know how much of that was real or not, but man, that was such great TV. And I'm thinking to myself, it was a hundred percent work. hundred <laughs> percent worked it out there. It wasn't like I had some pent up emotions that I took it out. I no, but Vince, he asked me that. That's he asked me, I don't know how much of that you had bottled up inside of you that you were just trying to get out, but man, that was some excellent TV. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, I think we're on to something because that's when you're working the boss, you're working everybody. And that's what this is about. Try to think we're suspending belief. They want to believe. So you got to let them believe sometimes. The validation behind that from Vince must have been amazing. Yeah. Um, let's see. Hi, homie. I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> My son just walked in. He just oh, he just graduated college and got a real job, but I, you know, selling New York life. So anybody needs life insurance out there, let me know. I got the guys going to do it. Uh, but so I let him, uh, he came home to get his feet underneath him again. Cause he was a poor college student. I go, just save some money, live at home. And now he's my beer drinking and golf buddy. So, uh, I have excuses every time I go, Hey, I'm going to go drink some beers. And my wife goes, who? I go, your son. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're playing golf with who? Your son. Okay. She, she can't say no. That's great. I'm telling him to move live here forever. <laughs> if you want to pop in and say hi. <laughs> nah, he's over. He's doing his stuff. Oh, he's doing his whole thing. Well, here from Rex, Chavo, you're skydiving. Uh, whose uh, parachute are you sabotaging if you're skydiving? Tony, Mamaluke, Kane, Big Show, or The Miz? Uh, I got to say The Miz only because we all hate The Miz in a, in a – wrestling hating right. way mike's a great guy but whose character is who's the best at his job making you hate him tony mamaluke kane big show or the miz the miz <laughs> you hate him right so that's so 100 plus his plus his wife's hot so maurice when you're a widow well, I guess I'm married too. Never mind. My son, I got my son for you. <laughs> uh, Brandon, nice to see you again. Looking good, boys. Hey, Chavo, did you work on the new Von Erichs movie? Yes, you see, you've been mentioning it, Iron Claw. If so, any stories you can tell? I know NDA can be tricky. So, yes, I was the wrestling coordinator, wrestling consultant on that film, uh, responsible for any all wrestling, everything wrestling, dialogue, outfits, everything i mean it wasn't making the outfits but i was approving outfits and stuff like that so uh along with the director sean dirk and all this movie. so uh yes i worked hand in hand with the director to make that movie uh it was can't wait for it to come out i uh, can't really tell any stories except for uh i will tell this i was filming young rock at the same time so oh. young rock was filming in memphis and um Iron Claw was filming in Baton Rouge. So they're about seven hours apart from each other by, by car. Well, in my contract, I have first class flights. I couldn't take any flights because I would get off set from one thing from let's say Young Rock and I would, 
okay, so tomorrow I'm not, I'm off. I'm doing things. So I would drive to Mem to Baton Rouge and then film there or train there and then get done with that and drive right back. So I was back and forth doing that. So um, <clears throat> it was really hard. I was a lot of tired, sleepless nights. I'm so glad I did it just because I just, I think that movie's, I really believe in that movie. I think it's going to, I think it's going to kill it. Zach Efron, Jeremy Aaron White, Harris Dickinson, they, Holt McCall McCallaghan. Gosh, they did. They were so good. I think there's going to be some Oscar in there somewhere because they're wow. all really, really, really great. I'm so happy to see Zach do it because he gets that um, that pretty boy image a lot because he's got a chiseled body and good looking guy. But what happens a lot of times when you have that, you know, people start overlooking you in Hollywood as, as being a serious actor. So take like a, a Brad Pitt. It took a long time for him to be, you know, to win an Oscar and to be considered in that race. Um, Matthew McConaughey had to lose all of that, go from that body that he was the ab guy, lose all that weight. And he, I mean, he had to do, they did Dyer's Dallas Buyers Club and won the Oscar. I mean, he malnutritioned himself. Look at what Christian Bale does, you know, for that role. So, yeah. It was really cool to see, you know, Zach. He, I hope he gets that recognition because he was did a phenomenal job acting. He's so good, but he put all of this weight on for that. He's not. He doesn't walk around like that. Right. He's always in great shape. Don't get me wrong, because that's just his lifestyle. But man, this guy never missed. I mean, in between wrestling matches, he'd go down and, and eat his quick little meal and drink his shake and stuff. You know, so he just never stopped. I mean, he just. I saw him transform bigger and bigger and bigger tighter stuff man he was like ready stage ready so anybody who know, who who does that you just you 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 know renee you know how hard that is how hard to keep that is you know yeah so uh, i'm i really hope that he gets that recognition he deserves he's awesome and a great guy uh rex here wants to apologize for before okay. uh, all good all good all good rex don't worry about it someone was sent before i could say hey don't worry about it rex it's all good Thanks awesome. for your five pounds. <laughs> five bucks. Mucho respeto por la guerreros. Thank you, Mrs. D What's her name? Miss 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 Disha. She's an awesome, awesome uh, member of our community here. Gracias, gracias. Thank you for support. Thank you. For Man, support. Can you? One thing I want to ask: Can you speak fluent Spanish? Yeah, I'm pretty good at it. I'm not like to the fence, like to the point to where I'm doing. I'm not doing interviews in. Mexico right. TV, but yeah, I can I can get around with anybody. I really need I need to go back to go to Mexico for three months, and I'll be completely totally. You'll be boom right back at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's one of those like you know I I really they like my whole family was fluent. My mom fluent as well. Yeah, but we we spoke English at the house. Right. I always grew up around it with my grandmother because my grandmother still well before she passed yeah. was still broken English. You know, though she lived here for <laughs> for you know fifty years. But, um, uh, you know, so I was always around Spanish so I can understand it 100% and speak it probably 75%. 75%. Yeah, yeah. So I can get, I can get around anywhere. Just any, anytime I start speaking Spanish, my friends are always like, oh, I always forget you can speak Spanish. Yeah, I'm all right. Dude, it's like when I moved to the States, man, I was there for like six years and I came back home to Canada. I forgot French. Right. Like, what the fuck? I had this. Or, or then all of a sudden you're using you're using American slang, or something. They're like, "What are you? Who are you?" Like, right? Drew McIntyre. When Drew McIntyre goes back to Scotland and he starts calling, instead of a petrol station, he's calling you know a gas station. They're like, "What are you? You've been in America way too long." You know, way too long. Using different terms. Yeah. All right. Let's last one, buddy. Send all my two dollar one story behind Kane beating you for the ECW title. Story behind your 06 title feud with Benoit. Why did AEW run not work out? All right, we'll, we'll for four nine nine. We'll, we'll ask. We'll get one of those. <laughs> story <laughs> behind Kane beating me for the ECW championship at WrestleMania. So Kane and I were working each other and had great chemistry. We were killing it. Then when WrestleMania matches come out, you know, there's only a certain amount of time, and you got to, you know, it wasn't too a uh, too Day show back then it was a one day show so you have two and a half hours two hours and 45 minutes of russell time to yeah. get in all of these matches and all of these storylines yeah plus have your celebrity guests in there and your your you know the your your music guest play and stuff so there's really a certain amount so they can only put a certain amount of matches in there so yeah. if you made it 
at WrestleMania. That's why they always have like a 20 man battle royal. So everybody would at least try to get on it. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, they, if you made a WrestleMania match, it's pretty big. It's pretty good. It's, pretty, it's very big awesome. Deal. Big deal. So it's not like a regular pay per view, it's WrestleMania. Um, so when we, the, when they start talking about it, we're the ECW champ, champ, ECW run. You know, you have the heavyweight championship, you have the WWE championship, you got the yeah. Intercontinental championship, you got the women's championship that you have to have out there now. You've got to be PC, yeah. and, and nothing taking anything about from the women because they're having some of the best matches on the shows now. Like they are. Charlotte, Charlotte just destroys it. I mean, every it's so good. Uh, Rhea, Rhea, oh my God, they're so good. Anyways, not to go too much into that, but you have these others, and then you have the regular. Matt, you got let's say Triple H is doesn't have a title, but he's got it. He's going to have a match there too. He's one of the big guys. Undertaker may not be going, but he's got the streak. So that's another match. There's a, there's so many matches they got to get on. So when they came to the the, the ECW uh, to the WrestleMania card, like the pre card before the before we it was set in stone. Me and Kane were left off it. So we went to Vince and Vince. We just feel like if we're left off of this, then this title means nothing and stuff. And we kind of pleaded our case. And you have to do that sometimes. Mm. And Vince was like, I agree. I absolutely agree. Okay, great. So now we're on the show. We're back on. We got like eight minutes. Okay, great. Eight minutes. No problem. We'll, we'll, we'll knock that out. Day before the show, we're we're still we're still holding true, you know. And you know, Renee, they constantly start changing times. They're shuffling times around. Well, now we got to budget this. Oh, this person signed last minute. This celebrity, okay. So we got to. That's the three minutes we got to start cutting times. <clears throat> so time starts getting shuffled around. They rarely add time to you on WrestleMania. It doesn't happen. They take time away for certain things. It just it's just what it goes, you know. Now people then now and then let's say a match goes long, goes two yeah. minutes. Huh. Well, now they got to cut the time. Yeah. <clears throat> so we weren't on it. Then we were on it with eight minutes. And then when we got there, we, we had like two minutes. What? He was like, man, I'm sorry, guys. Well, you know, whatever. I promise you guys would be on, though. He was holding his promise, though. So. Yeah. And we're like, well, what are we going to do with two minutes? We're not going to do shit with two minutes. No one's going to remember that for anything. They'll, no one would ever remember that match. But they will remember getting beaten eight seconds. That's something. If I had a, a two minute match, no one would ever, ever ask me about my WrestleMania match to Kane. Mm -hmm. But because I had an eight second match, I get asked all the time. Yeah. So it goes back to the sense that what my grandfather should tell us it doesn't matter if they're talking good about you or talking bad about you, as long as they're talking about you. Because once they stop talking about you, now you have to, now you, now you, you worry. That's that's when you got to worry about something. <clears throat> so we said, "Hey, what if I do my entrance? Kane's music comes out. No entrance, no entrance. Where is he at? He pops up behind me, choke slams me right there. Beat one, two, three. Because he won. He's Kane. He comes out from anywhere. I have a gripe. He cheated. Even though I'm a light cheat steel guy, there's it kind of crosses all you know crosses all the T's and dots all the eyes. Yeah. Uh." Vince was like, wow, you do, you do, that's great. Absolutely. So, and that's, that's what happened. And that's, that's what we did. So, and, and that, this is the truth. That was my high, that eight seconds was my highest paying match of all time. hundred <laughs> percent true. It was your favorite match. That eight, it came out to some ridiculous amount, ridiculous amount of tens of thousands of dollars per second. That I was in there, like, like, like ridiculous. Like I was like, how is that even possible? Like, so I remember going to Jr. who was doing the payoffs at the time, and I went to him because everybody bitches about about payoffs, and I have as well. I'm guilty as that as well. As well, you have to sometimes plead your case to get a better payoff. <clears throat> well, I went to him. I said, thank you, man. You didn't have to do that. And he's like, well, I think you guys did business with us. We do business with you, and. Uh, and you know we appreciate it. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess if we had the two minute match, I guarantee you we would not have made that amount of money. Really? Oh no, it would have been forgotten. No one remember that. There you go. You're right. Mm -hmm. 
You're right, man. Well, Chavo, man, I just want to thank you for all the years. You're always super cool to me. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you for coming, spending a couple hours with us and giving us your time. And, you know, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen you in 16 years, but uh, it might be another 16 until I see you again, but it might be in six months. It might be in six I weeks. Hope, I hope it's less. Know. I hope it's less, man. Renee, I'll tell you this, bro. We come from a wrestling families and nobody understands wrestling families except for wrestling families. You just, right. you just, it's impossible to know yeah. what we grew up with and how our, our dads were gone and the, the protection of the business and the kayfabe and growing up in the locker room and, you know, taking bumps when you're three years old. No one <laughs> knows that life of a wrestler except a person who grew up in it. So yeah. any wrestling family to me is my family, you know, and and I, I honestly believe that. And we just, you know, there's times that you have to sit back and let the person have you learn sometimes on their own. And there's times when you don't and you pull them on your wing. So Renee, you're a family to me, my brother, and you're you're you you know what I've been through much more than a lot of people have. And and uh you know, same with the hearts and you know, the roads and, and Samoan dynasty and the McMahons, you know, everybody. Like we're all really a big family. Just <clears throat> no one knows what we went through. No way. Yeah, you're right, man. Well, I want to thank you again for your time and uh oh, there's so many other ones, but yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank definitely you. keep in touch. Absolutely. You got my number, brother. Keep in touch, man. I appreciate you, man. Thank all you right, for having man. me, guys. Take care, my friend. I appreciate you guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.